there's some courts that are saying that. Good morning, everyone. How are you all doing? Thank you so much for coming in. You guys look great. I love to see people get involved here. Uh, we're going to call this meeting to order the Driver Training and Traffic Safety Advisory Committee uh, meeting. My name is Ricardo Benavides, Chair. Um, we'll start with item A. Delia, do you mind uh, calling the uh, roll call? I'm sorry. Ricardo Benavides. Present. David Bruce. Blake Garrett. Present. Cindy Jo Newland. Francis Gomez. Kevin Knapp. Here. Dr. Patricia Lark. Carlos Reina. Present. Nina Jo Saint. Present. Sam L. Webb. Present. Glenn Winningham. Here. Thank you, Lilia. One, two, three. That's seven present, three absent. Um, we do have a quorum present. Mr. Chairman, Brian Francis, it's my understanding that uh, Mr. Bruce is on his way, so he should be here shortly, okay? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. So Bruce will be here. Okay, I'd like to make a motion, uh, members, to excuse uh, Cindy Joe, of course, Francis Gomez. Oh, hello. Hi. Good to see you. Way over this way. I think you're down there. Here we go. Thank you. Sorry, y'all. Thank you so much for making it, Cindy. How are you? Good, thank you. Okay, members, I, I move, uh, make a motion here to excuse the. Um, the three that are not here, that is, my apologies, Francis Gomez, Dr. Lark, and of course, David will be here in just a little bit. I second the motion. Thank you, Carlos, so much. All those in favor? Signify by saying aye. Thank you. Any opposed? Motion carries. Excellent. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, who seconded the motion? Carlos. Uh, Carlos okay. seconded the motion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Our next item is the approval of the minutes for our meeting of July the 12th. Uh, board members, um, I'm sure you all have had an opportunity to read our minutes from the last one. Anybody have any questions? Mr. Chairman, can we hold one second? Um, we we're getting some equipment change for our real audio. Um, we're having a little bit of difficulty, so we may have to go to an alternative meeting. So if we can pause the meeting, uh, sure. just recess. Did you want to take a break or just Please. chill? Just take a break. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, nice. Thank you so much. We'll Absolutely. Absolutely. I didn't get out of there. It was, it was raining, so it was kind of... 
Oh, sweet. We are back. Thank you so much. Again, we were on item C, the approval of the minutes. Board members, anybody have any questions about those? I'll consider a motion to approve the minutes. I'll make a motion that we approve the minutes from July Thank you, 12th. Kevin, so much. We have a motion on the floor to second approve the motion. minutes on the last one. Second the motion. Thank you, Sam, so much. We second them. Uh, all those uh, in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Excellent motion carries. Thank you. This next uh, portion of our meeting is the public comment. We uh, actually have the public, um, as the public, those of you that are here, you have the option to come up here and, and speak for three minutes um, to the advisory, of course, board. and. Uh, in regards to anything that you'd like to talk about. Now, I have actually two public comment forms. If you'd like to speak to the advisory committee, you're more than welcome to walk up to the front here and just fill one of these out. Just bring them over to Excuse me or there. Mr. Yeah. Chairman, can we there. announce? We, um, we'd Mr. like to know who you are. And yes. Link, could we just announce Mr. Bruce's arrival on, on the record? Oh, absolutely. Sorry, a few minutes later. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Della, so much. I appreciate that. Just want to recognize that David Bruce has arrived. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. All right. I uh, have two. I have two public forum comments, and uh, I'll invite the first one will be uh, Tommy Anderson. Mr. Anderson, come on up. He's with the Southwest Tow Operators. That's right. Good morning, Tommy. How are you? Good morning. Good morning, Tommy Anderson, Southwest Tow Operators, and thank you all for letting me speak here. Um, we came here today to raise awareness of the move over law. Um, which we, in talking to the people in this room, we see that there's a lot of awareness and everybody is um, actually doing that and, and training and uh, talking about the move up. The towing industry uh, loses around 60 towers a year uh, on the side of the road trying to help people. Um, and of course, sometimes the person we're trying to help is involved in that accident also. Um, I was kind of shocked looking at some numbers that um, DPS wrote 17,000 warning and citations last year and 6,000 in the first five months this year. And uh, according to a national poll sponsored by the National Safety Commission, 71% uh, of Americans don't even know about the move over law. We talk to people every day that don't have a clue. Uh, so I'm, I'm very happy to hear that you all are helping us get that word out. Um, if you all have some time, I'd love for you all to look at um, what we call atspiritride.com, where we work with law enforcement and fire. Um, and we've had over 97 ceremonies across the United States in the last five months. 
uh, involving fire, police, and tow truck operators and trying to get the word out to the public about the move over law. Um, you'll probably even see billboards up. I know in New Mexico, um, a good friend of mine, Linda Unruh, her son was killed on the side of the road helping somebody. Uh, she had a law passed called Bobby's mm -hmm. Law. And um, there's 18 or 19 billboards right now, trucking companies in the state, and everybody's helping put that up. And that's getting catchy um, around the whole United States. So again, I'm, I'm really happy to see that everybody is participating and helping us get the word out. We'd love to help you get the word out. Uh, we brought some posters here. Um, if anybody would like them, feel free to take them. It's a move over law poster. It involves police, fire, um, all EMS people and tow truck operators. And if I don't have enough posters here, if you leave me a card, I promise I'll send you mm -hmm. some in the mail. So other than that, I'm, again, I'm happy to see you all are doing that, and thank you very much. And again, we're here to help you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so thank much, Tom. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Our next um, public comment is from uh, Jeff, is it? Thank you, Jeff. Come on up. Thank you so much, sir. How do you pronounce your last name? Neenstead. Neenstead. Thank you so much, Jeff. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank you all for giving me the opportunity to address the board this morning. Uh, I'm going to take a spin off of Tommy's. Um, again, we're up here to raise awareness on the move over law. Uh, just this year, I've had three of my trucks and drivers impacted by this um, on accident scenes. Um, it's going to be really important to get it out to the kids. Uh, we're going to be going after some other stuff at the first of the year. It would be great to be able to see a, uh, like the seatbelt course, the four-hour seatbelt course. Um, once you have that ticket, you've got the mandatory course. Uh, we'd like to see something like that possibly for the move-over law. We can get the enforcement going. Um, it's just uh, added information. All of us in this room, we're, we're, we're getting older every day, so some of us might need a refresher course every once in a while. Um, so again, uh, I've talked to a couple of people in my local area and I'm finding out today that there might be more about the move over law in the curriculum, but it'd be nice to see an allotted amount of time, maybe a little more time spent on the move over law to explain who all is involved in it, how it's used. Um, a lot of us call it the move over law. I honestly think we need to call it the slow down and move over law because a, a lot of people don't realize if you could just slow down, you don't have to move over if it's not safe. Um, but I think it's going to be real important to, to verse it correctly and then hopefully get some of this other stuff in place. I appreciate it, y'all. That's great. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Do we have anybody at this time that would like to come up and speak before we move on to our next item? Thank you so much. Any questions, board members, before we continue? Our next item, anybody? We're good? All right. Our next item is uh, staff reports. Briefing from the staff and discussion. Uh, executive office, what do we got? Mr. Chairman, Brian Francis, executive director with sir. TDLR. How are you doing? Very good. Thank uh, you. So, you know, just not that I'm keeping track of it, but it's a year and 34 days. Uh, that I've been at the helm and the wheels are still on TDLR, so I'm excited about that. <laughs> yes. uh, I know I've got some of my staff just holding the wheels in place for me, but they're doing a great job. Um, I, I think it's exciting to have the folks from the, the towing industry here, to see that crossover from our different programs that we regulate. Uh, and frankly, uh, I've known Tommy for several years now. That's the most words he's ever said collectively, <laughs> ever. Uh, and he did, he, Tommy did a great job up there. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to touch a little bit on, on the Harvey response. Uh, I don't think any of us have, have um, I think every last one of us actually have been impacted by it at some level. Uh, and, and it's trying to, to get your mind around just the degree and the magnitude of the devastation, it's really tough. Uh, we thought three days before when it landed we were already working with the governor's office on putting in together some initiatives and some interventions that would help us respond to it. Uh, the towing industry was at the front of that. Uh, we uh, identified the need for some emergency tow folks coming in. Uh, when you have estimated 300,000 to a million vehicles that are going to be stranded, that's a lot. Uh, and so we were able to work with the governor's office to put into place some emergency tow, uh, consent tow operators and did it for the companies in the vehicles. I'll share some of those stats with you, but it was a big deal and it's been extremely helpful to, to get that um, 
help from out of state for Texans. Uh, that was the first part of it. And then when it hit and we saw the level of it and the, the level of destruction, I mean, the wheels start turning then. We put together a disaster response team. We meet probably every other day here at the agency just trying to identify what other things can we do. And you can imagine with TDLR having this broad umbrella of activities and programs, uh, we have a lot of angles that are impacted by this. Uh, another area that we started looking into very shortly was how can we assist in what is referred to as the uh, recovery or rebuild phase. And that was looking at our air conditioning program and our electrician program finding ways to get those folks that are qualified, talented folks that, that have the tools in their belt and getting them here to help Texans get back up and running quickly. So we identified some expedited path for uh, air conditioning technicians to come in place or if you're an air conditioning contractor to come in through reciprocity through the six or seven states that we have reciprocity with. We also identified the same thing for the uh, electrical apprentices uh, that if you wanted to come in day one and help out, you could come into Texas uh, get registered as a, an apprentice, work through a company, because we also know that in these type of situations, they're not just people who chase the storms, but they chase the money and they bring the fraud with them. And we're able to keep intact the, um, the infrastructure for the electrical contractors and air conditioning contractors to make sure that the business side of it was being done by folks who are properly licensed with the right insurance, the criminal background checks and those things in place. Uh, we also took a look at the, uh, the licensees that were in those affected areas. TLR had more than 263,000 of our licensees in those 60 counties. That's quite a bit um, of folks. And so we wanted to make sure that we were taking care of those folks and primarily removing the burden and bureaucracy off of their plate. You can imagine that when your house is underwater, the last thing you want to worry about is, oh, do I need to go renew my, my TLR license? Oh, I, I need to go take that continuing education course. So we identified the need to, have, to extend the expiration dates for about 23,912 of our licensees. So we moved it out 60 days so they didn't have to worry about that. Uh, we waived the, the continuing education requirements for folks who are renewing in that time period. Uh, we waived the duplicate license and replacement license fee for folks that were coming back. Um, if you're in a barber shop, uh, you know, you got to have your little sign on the wall. Well, guess what? That could have been underwater. So we replaced or waived that fee for those folks. Uh, people who are expired with late renewals, we late waived their late renewal fee. Uh, when I show you the numbers of the people that were impacted by it, it's real dollars and it's real relief for Texans in those situations. Uh, we started looking at our other programs that we have uh, in terms of the plan reviews. Uh, so if you are, are going to, if you have an elevator, there were over 250 elevators that were submerged in, in Houston alone. And so we regulate elevators. Well, those elevators are either going to be damaged and you have to replace them or repair them. Uh, to do that in Texas, you have to have a plan review that says, here's the capacity of the elevator, here's the type of elevator we're putting in that shaft. Uh, we were able to waive the uh, $800 off of the fee for that because it's $1,000 to get expedited. So it's a $200 review fee. If that elevator had to be taken out of service, we waived the, two, the $20 removed from service fee so the folks didn't have to worry about that cost coming in place. Another big um, intervention that we coordinate with the governor's office is that well, there are boilers that we regulate that are bigger than this building. They're enormous boilers in the refineries. And those boilers, if you shut them down for a day, it's $7.5 million a day for some of them being down. That's how much revenue is lost. Uh, we were able to identify a way of safely keeping those boilers up and operating and having that same internal uh, inspection fee, uh, inspection requirement waveform. That's a huge deal. The refineries were able to get up quicker and not have to lose that money, and they were able to do it safely uh, within the confines of the statute. So that was a big deal that we were able to work out with folks as well. Uh, we now have, you know, 13 health programs, or on November 1 we'll have 13 health programs. So a good portion of our licensees, the dyslexia therapists, the dietitians, the speech language pathologists, and audiologists, uh, the athletic trainers, uh, the orthotists and prosthetists, those folks, uh, there were people who wanted to come from out of state to help in hospitals or healthcare facilities. Uh, we coordinated with the governor's office. When he gave the, the green light, we were able to say, if you're coming from out of state, working in that facility, that facility just needs to email us, tells their name, what state you're from, what city, and you can go in there and help Texans. Again, the big deal is that if you are working that 12-hour shift, that 14-hour shift in the hospital, you, this is providing that bench strength, that relief to allow you to take a break. And the last person you want to be fatigued is somebody who's working on a health care issue for our families and our friends. 
So that was another intervention and initiative that we were able to put in place uh, for those folks. Uh, obviously, on your end, uh, we identified the number of schools that were impacted. Later in the agenda, Mr. Chairman, we'll talk about you know, the creation of a memorial certificate. Um, unfortunately, there was a driver education school owner who died uh, during Harvey, um, Mr. Jordan, and, and so we want to definitely honor him and the contributions he's made, and we'll talk about that a little bit later in the, uh, the agenda. Um, other programs that we regulate right now, we have water well drillers, and so wells were filled up with water. We provide information on how you can sanitize those wells so you can get them back up and running. Uh, we talk to folks on how they can bring their boilers back up safely. These are the boilers that are in laundromats, that are in schools, that are in hospitals, bringing those and firing those back up safely so that they don't cause any damage or any injury <coughs> going back up when they're helping out folks. Uh, the other thing is how do you, um, if you do all these wonderful things to help Texans, um, you got to connect them to the information. And so our outreach efforts have been significant. Uh, we've, we've coordinated with the different associations. We've sent, obviously, in our listserv message, our Facebook page, our Twitter page. Uh, we are now in the process of doing what we call embedded disaster, team, uh, embedded disaster response teams where we're going to Beaumont. We'll be in Beaumont uh, this Sunday. We'll, we were in, Houston, in San Antonio last week. We'll be in Houston uh, this Sunday and just having a physical presence in those cities so that if there are licensees or their family members saying, hey, my mom's been a cosmetologist for 20 years, she, she's worried about her license, what can she do? We're going to have the ability to help them through those moments, provide them with information that will help them get through this, this crazy time. Uh, we've had some of our folks in our electrical department and division three or four days after landfall, they were in Port Aransas and they were doing damage assessment on homes and schools and property to determine is this uh, facility safe enough to get the electricity on? What is it going to take to do that? And they've been going every other weekend since. Uh, and that's just the heart of our employees involved in this process. Mr. Chairman, we have a document that's in front of you. It looks kind of like this. Do you guys have that? Um, on page six of that document, I just wanted to highlight a few of the, um, the results of our efforts. Uh, and I'll just stop and say that I'm extremely proud of our staff. Uh, their, their commitment to doing their job and to serving in this, this crisis in this moment has just been phenomenal. Um, we're just fortunate to have them here. So emergency consent tow operators, there's 1,035 folks that came in from out of state to help. To put that in context, the last hurricane, we had 93 licenses. So 1,035 people came in. This, that's how big Harvey uh, was and how significant it was. Uh, when you look at the number of apprentice electricians, 271 folks, uh, sign electricians, 10, uh, the reciprocity for master electricians, 19, uh, down there for CE hours, way 4,335 folks. Uh, they didn't have to worry about taking continuing education this time because they were in those areas. Late fees waived, $2,237. That can range between $25 and $150 for those late fees. So that's money that stayed in their pocket they didn't have to worry about. Uh, replacement fees uh, for duplicate licenses, 821. Uh, we extended the expirations of 23,912 folks down there. The customer service contacts, we've had 21,593 unique calls relating to Harvey. So not just the regular uh, volume of calls coming in, but that's specifically uh, dealing with the Harvey situation. 539 emails. Uh, I know our, our customer service division uh, was working hard. They were extending the hours for the customer service from 6 in the morning so we can get to those emails and respond and provide uh, the service to the folks. Uh, we've sent out over 901,000 um, emails uh, to, to provide information about the web page. If you look on page 7 of the document, that's the 263,000 uh, licensees that we have in those impacted counties, 60 counties. And uh, we were able to provide information on uh, the population by our program. So you can see there's 1,625 um, instructors and schools in those affected areas. And I know Ray and them have some information that they'll provide on that. Um, Mr. Chairman, I offer this to simply say that there's not enough we can do to, to bring those folks back to normal, but we're doing everything we can to remove the bureaucracy uh, and just the, um, uh, the concern of having to deal with government in this difficult time. Uh, we've suspended inspections in that area so that a uh, person doesn't have to worry about TLR knocking on their door uh, to inspect their, you know, dre uh, flooded out building, uh, that they get to take care of that. But if there's an inspection needed to get a school up and running quickly, 
we're going to move that to the front of the line and expedite that. So we're trying to be sensitive to uh, the needs of the folks in that area. And we're continuing to uh, identify new ways of, of working with it. Uh, we're in the process of working with the, um, uh, our staff internally on a, an initiative that will help with what are relocatable um, buildings, which are uh, the temporary structures that are out there for schools. Uh, we've got an opportunity with one of our programs maybe to expedite that, get some more of those in Texas uh, so that people can be up and running that way. Uh, but that's, that's what's going on. Um, again, I'm proud of the staff and everything they've done. Uh, it's been a lot, but uh, <coughs> I, I don't think we can do enough, you know, in this moment. And I also want to just kind of, you know, just let Ray know that we're thinking about his, his family in Puerto Rico. Uh, you know, they are on the island. They are with electricity and they have food and water, but uh, that wasn't always the case a couple of days ago and a couple of weeks ago. So, uh, Ray, know that we're thinking about you too, okay? Mr. Thank Mambay, you, Thank you so much, too. Brian. I appreciate that. I know that uh, the industry appreciates all the hard work that TDLR does for us. Ray, if I, I mean, uh, if I may. Yes. Wow. And I'm pointing at some of our customer service folks and our E and E people, and I mean, we've got a great group of people. Incredible. We've got a great group. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions? Members, our next uh, item is uh, compliance division. Good morning, Chairman, members. Uh, Michael Strawn, I'm with Compliance Division for Driver Education and Safety. Uh, today, just have a couple uh, projects that I'm excited to bring you all up to speed on. Uh, when we last talked, I brought up that we were doing some website updates for our FAQs. Um, we did the parent taught FAQs uh, in the past. Uh, this time we went with our general driver education FAQs as well. Um, quite a few of them we went through and our goal was to kind of simplify them. Uh, we, we like to say plain talk. Um, also to clarify a few issues as well. We found that other agencies are using our FAQs to interpret their own policies. Um, some of the way that some of those FAQs were written uh, as carried over um, may have confused items. We're finding, we, we didn't understand why other agencies were um, providing the policies and the interpretation of that as, as, as they were. And we were finding the lots of time spent trying to correct those things and educa educate them on it. Um, and then we found out they were pointing back to our FAQs. And, and so I went and read them, and I could understand their, their confusion from them. So it, again, prompted us to go through and just look at everything and say, how can we make this friendly or easier um, for everybody to understand, even our own internal employees? Um, so that was carried out. Uh, we finished that on August 15th. And um, you know, even down to things like transfers, I mean, we've been doing transfers between schools for a very long time now, uh, but it was some stuff that was just causing some headaches. I'm, I'm, I haven't heard anything since, and it seems to all have been uh, clarified, and everybody seems to be working with it, so I'm excited there, and I hope that those were positive changes. Um, we also, in kind of spirit of that, uh, we made change, a small change to our parent taught information guide uh, on the order page and the guide itself. Um, again, uh, there was a statement on there that said that uh, I'll just read it. It says, no instruction is permitted prior to receipt of the Parent Taught Driver Education Program Guide. Any instruction prior to that time will not be accepted toward the required instruction time. Um, we don't actually enforce that. We, if somebody completes a Parent Taught course and goes all the way through everything and then they realize, oh, I need this information guide, we're not having them forfeit all their hours, re-roll into another course. Um, but that was the interpretation of, of some folk as well. So remove that second sentence from there. We do want them to purchase that information guide. It is required, um, but that student's not losing their instruction that they just completed yesterday because they, they, they bought that, that course, um, especially with all the parent talk course providers typically providing a lot of that information as well up front. Um, so we're hoping that that is something that is beneficial to our customers as well when they go into a driver's license office or dealing with a, a course provider. Uh, that, that it provides a little bit of understanding there and helps clarify for everybody and we don't have upset com customers being turned away uh, that have to go back to a driver's license office, wait another four weeks, five weeks for a driver, uh, a uh, drive examination at that point. 
Uh, so excited about that as well. It's a small thing, but it, it really is impactful for a lot of people's lives. Um, we also, on August 16th, uh, myself and the e and &E individuals met with the inspectors that are going out and doing routine inspections. Uh, this was immediately after they kind of started uh, going out and, and getting trained on it, so we met with them about a week or two afterwards uh, to kind of hear what, they, what, what the common items they were seeing were, answer some of their questions, and continue to try to train them up. Uh, it's something we want to continue to do as well, to meet with them and see, especially now that they've got a little bit more time under their belts, to see exactly uh, what they're seeing out there, what questions they have, and, and uh, constantly improve ourselves as well and see how we can help improve the, the driver education community at the same time. Um, so uh, there were, for the most part, I think they're having a lot of uh, success in that. I mean, Ray's group can speak to it a little bit more in depth, obviously, than I can. Um, but they, you know, we, we had really good feedback from them. I know they've had a lot of great interactions and really getting to know the community out there. And, and uh, so far, it, I think it's been very beneficial for the program. Um, one other thing that we did uh, was the, the rules that you'll see the, that we're putting up for adoption and everything. Uh, I assisted with those as well, working with E&E &E and with our general counsel. Um, and, and we'll just continue to do that in, in our role. And a few other things. Uh, that we're looking at is we developed uh, standard operating procedures or in process of developing standard operating procedures for education and examination. Uh, it provides standardization between all the individuals that are doing the work. Um, it allows us to provide clear, concise answers when anybody asks us anything. Um, and it also will help us improve efficiency. We'll, uh, our education and examination division is the division that approves the school licenses for uh, the driver education and safety community. Uh, the instructors are handled by our licensing group, and we hope that through this we can come up and standardize the process, hopefully speed up the, the school application process, uh, look for when we're going through it, it's always good to have all eyes on it and see where we may be duplicating processes, where we can simplify the process for our applicants as well. Uh, and we're finding a lot of that as we go through it. So hopefully, you know, probably not the next one, but the next advisory board meeting, but soon we'll be able to provide you all with an example of that. And, and show you our hard work there. Uh, the last project that I have is uh, one that's fairly significant and uh, we worked with education examination as well um, and we were looking at creating something to track all of the bonds for schools. Right now there's, there's we do enter that information into a database. It's the information was pulled over from TEA um, but there wasn't a real way to put eyes on it and see what we could do. Um, as far as monitoring and ensuring that, that all these schools hold their bond. We look for it upon application, but some of them may get canceled or uh, it may get skipped over. And, and just not having that oversight is something that, as a regulating body, I thought was important, uh, especially in light of some school closures that we've had. Um, the bond is one of the very few avenues that we have to actually assist those citizens that are in need during that time. Uh, so I found it was critical and, and pivotal that we actually have something in place and do our due diligence to, to monitor that. And uh, I'm happy to say that that's going well. I've identified some, uh, some things that I, that I think will be very helpful to our community and uh, make sure that everybody's in compliance with state laws in that regard. So, um, that's all I have for you all. If you have any questions for me, I'll be happy to answer them. Great work, Michael. From you and your department, I really appreciate it. Any questions, members? Michael? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Moving right along uh, to our next item is E3 Education and Examination Division. Morning, Carrie. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Good morning, members. Good morning. I'll just get right to it because we've got a lot to cover today. So I want to start with legislative updates. As you all know, we had several legislative bills that affected driver education. Carrie, could you just say your name? Safety. We all know your name. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie Hodges, Education <laughs> Exam. I just got excited. This is funny. <clears throat> so we had uh, several bills that affected the driver education and safety world as we know it. So just to give you a quick update on where we are on these particular implementations and their, the bill timelines. House Bill 912 and Senate Bill 848, there were th several things within that particular bill that happened. There was the reduction from the driving safety bond to $10,000. Those uh, bond documents have been updated. 
when you send in your new updates or with we, with your bond renewal, it should be on that new that new bond information. Those are on the website. We created a designation form for the Parent Taught Driver Education Program for a parent to designate an individual to do the driver education for the student at no cost, or they're not supposed to charge a fee. That is still being approved, and it's coming pretty pretty quickly. We have, uh, with that, we're updating the uh, Parent Taught Driver Education Guide to include that form. Those of you that are in the Parent Taught world will also know that there is a couple of affidavits in there for classroom affidavit and a, um, uh, a cl um, sorry a behind the wheel affidavit. Those have been removed. We spoke with DPS, and we uh, we all agreed that the information that the affidavits re request is the exact same information that's on the DE 964, or as you know, the certificate course of completion. They were really unnecessary, and it was just an, a, an additional step for the parent. And so those those have been removed. And once the new guide goes out, the designation form goes out, all of that information will be will be released. DPS is aware; they are training their folks as well. We're, we're training our folks. Uh, you will get inf more information when we actually release all that information out to the public to be put into into place. <coughs> for House Bill 1372 is the child passenger safety law. We are all very well aware that it's in the curriculum. We are just making it more prevalent in the curriculum, more of a standout that it needs to be covered. Uh, there are some resources that TechStot has that you could go to their website and get some great videos. Uh, for the driver education driving safety schools, if you need more updated videos, TechStot has some of that really good information. We have a link on our website for that, as well as I think railroad safety, we have a link for those as well. For Senate Bill 30, that is, I will tell you after we did actually speak to Senator West who, who headed up this particular bill, he does prefer for us to refer to it as its actual name, which I'm completely great with, the Community Safety Education Act. We just say Senate Bill 30. This actually puts more weight to it. It's the Community Safety Education Act. We have met with a committee at this time. It consists of individuals from TCOL, which is the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement the Department of Public Safety, the Texas Education Agency, who is representing the State Board of Education. Uh, Nina Saint is actually on that one as well, representing a public interest. And we have another gentleman from the, the uh, it's called TAPS, and uh, you'll have to excuse me, I can't remember what it stood for. I had it There you go, Teen and Police Services. And they are also, and so we have, uh, with this committee, we have a, a basically a lot of brains in there to try to make this program the best that it is. As you are well aware, it's, it, it is going to be required to be in all driver education and all driving safety programs. We do not have a time requirement on it. Currently what we are working on on our side of the committee is we are looking at the topics to add to the program of organized instruction. We are looking at the seven steps for violator contact that every law enforcement official in Texas learns during their training, and we're basically mushing them all together just to make sure that it is that it goes along with it. We're creating, you know, creating that content. We are going to meet again with this particular committee on October 24th, and everybody's going to come together, and we're going to just exchange ideas and see what we've come up with. It was a very productive meeting. It was very exciting to see that everybody was really on the same page. The largest goal of the community. Safety Education Act is to make sure that every single person that is taking this is getting consistent information. That is the largest, that is actually the, the main goal of this, that students that are in grades 9 through 12 that are taking driver education, if you, they have to take a driving safety, and all peace officers, everybody is being taught the exact same thing, so there's consistency across the state. So we're excited to move forward with that. We have Senate Bill 1051, that is the American Sign Language course for the deaf and hard of hearing. We did meet with the uh, Texas School for the Deaf. We are doing some other feelers out there to, 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 to figure out who we want to help us produce this actual driver education video. Uh, we are still working on drafting the rules. There's, there's a lot to do with this one. I don't have much more than that right now because this one, w we're being methodical. We're trying to knock each one out as it, as it comes along, but I will tell you that it will be available starting next September as that is our timeline and that's the requirement of the law. So that part I can tell you. As we get more information, you will be notified of that information. 
for the uh, uh, for the next item, we have uh, our compliance. Uh, Michael, that was just up here. He's been working with Shanesty and my team uh, on again updating the forms for the. Uh, uh, the redesign, I'm sorry, for the course provider bond. Again, that's on the website. Make sure and, and uh, uh, go check that out when you go to update your bond information. And the last thing that I just really want to uh, bring up is our periodic inspections. Uh, it's, it's on here as we've talked about periodics. As you know, we started last July or this past July. For uh, the fiscal year of two, uh, 2017, which started basically September 1st, 2016, and just ended on Octo uh, August 31st of 2017. We have done, our, our inspectors have done 209 periodic inspections. Uh, in, your, in your information, you will see what the common violations or common findings, I'm sorry, not violations, the common findings that we're seeing in these, uh, in these different periodic inspections. That's some really good information. I'll let you guys look over that. And so if you have any questions after this, you're more than welcome to come to any of my team and, and ask us. But uh, that's pretty much it if anybody has any questions. Carrie, yes, this sir. is Carl Schwein. Was On Senate Bill 30, was there any discussion with respect to a, a producing a video that might be able to provide yes. the information? As a matter of fact, the TAPS program that I spoke of, they are actually going to get with real, <coughs> real teens and they're going to be pulled over almost in a mock situation, but they're going to videotape it, have them pulled over and then do an interview after, with them afterwards and talk about what's going, what was going through your head. What was your first reaction? You know, how, how did you feel to react? What we discussed in this meeting was extremely important, which was to point out the irony of the fear on both sides of the fence. You have the, the police, they have a fear walking up to the car, and you have the, the, the individual in the car with the fear of the police walking up to the car. So yes, that is definitely on, uh, on the books for that. We are trying to get this out as soon as possible. The, the videos they're going to produce, and we're going to put everything in together. And that may come a little later, but it is definitely on the books to have that happen. Carlos Rain again. Uh, is there a timeline for when this is going to be expected to be in the courses? This is supposed to be, by law, it has to be by next September. And by so we, September. We, we are trying to get it before then. Uh, it depends. We ha like I said, we have a very large committee that we're working with, three different agencies, trying to get everybody on the same page is, is always a fun thing. But we all have the same goal and the same passion for this, and so we are, we are working uh, very diligently on this. I will tell you that a lot of the work has been done for us, which is great. Those of you that are not aware, there was a committee that met with Senator West last year in 2016. They made several recommendations on what they felt were the proper interactions that citizens and police officers should go through. That information is now in the Texas Driver's Handbook. If you are not aware, the Texas Driver's Handbook, the 2017 version, is now available. It is available online only. They are no longer printing copies. It is just a, it is, it's a, it's a version online only, uh, but you're more than welcome to print out copies for yourselves and for your students. But that information has been updated starting on page 68, if I'm not mistaken. So that information is in there, and we're taking from that information, and we're creating the curriculum, or the, the content from the topics, making sure everything goes together, and, and doing the things that we need to do as far as TDLR to come back to this committee and make sure that everybody's on the same page. Any additional questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carrie. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, um, I'm not sure if you guys were able to catch that tactical term, but mush together <laughs> is um, it's part of the TDLR vernacular, and, and it just means a combination and combining of different ideas into something <coughs> palatable. Very nice. Thank you. Very nice. <laughs> Thank you. I did that with breakfast this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Our next job, item Carrie. is E4, Enforcement Division. <coughs> Excuse me. Good morning, Chairman Benavides. Good morning. Board members. I'm Ron Foster with the Enforcement Division. I'm a senior prosecutor, one of two senior prosecutors in the Enforcement Division. 
we are the ones handling the cases for your program. I'd like to present to you the enforcement report, a little overview of that report. Let you know that I was checking the status of the cases this morning. Um, we have 45 open cases right now. Uh, those are in various stages in the enforcement division. Some of them are in the intake section, meaning they've just, the complaints have just been received. Um, we've got some that are in investigation. We've got some sitting in my hands, and uh, Charlotte uh, Melder is the other senior prosecutor. We've got some in our hands. <coughs> so together, that's about 45 cases. Now, um, I want you to understand that uh, we, most of the cases we're getting right now, you've heard a little bit about the inspection, the periodic inspection process that's going on, but most of the cases we're getting right now are consumer complaint type of cases. So just I was going through some of my cases randomly just looking to see what kind of complaints that I have so I could share that with you. And what I was seeing was complaints about the completion of the course, um, student being dropped early from the course, uh, schools closing, refund issues as Michael Strong brought up. Uh, we've got unlicensed instructor issues that have come up, expired licenses. As you will see from the case highlight, that's one of the cases that we have. Um, we have some uh, situations where there's been a uh, failure to pay for the driver education packet. <laughs> so we get an in, uh, insufficient funds check. We have to go after that, so we pursue that. Um, then we've also had more serious violations. You have the criminal conduct violations where we might deny a license based upon that. And we also have inappropriate contact with the uh, by an instructor, got a case like that and another one of unprofessional statements by an instructor. So those, that's just a flavor of the type of cases we have. It doesn't mean those are going to all go forward or that we're going to prove um, fine violations, but that's just a flavor of the type of cases that we get, you know, all kinds of complaints that come in. Now, um, to build off of what uh, my ex uh, executive director, Brian Francis, was saying, enforcement has, um, because of Harvey, we've taken a step back for the last uh, month or so. We haven't been issuing a lot of notices of violations, especially to folks that we uh, thought might be complainants or respondents that were in the affected area, which is a very large area. If you heard the uh, governor's proclamations, it covered a lot of counties, a lot of cities. So we had all of our prosecutors go through all of their cases and review each one to determine whether or not they were in an affected area. And, and we just basically put those on halt. We're like, we don't want to go forward with those. We don't want to, you know, aggravate a bad situation. So um, there's a little bit of slowdown. I know uh, everybody loves to hear from enforcement, but there's some people that are, you know, on hold right now, not getting to hear from us because of that. So we, we expect to pick up on that in the near future. But one of the things we're going to do is we're going to look to see, um, well, first off, we're going to be listening to people. If, if anybody says that they were affected in any way by the by the disasters, we're, <coughs> we're going to be taking that into consideration on our cases. Frankly, there's some things that are more important than others, and when you look at certain types of violations, they don't really appear to be so important after you've had your premises flooded or things like that might have happened, people losing their possessions and their homes. and So we're taking that all into consideration on our cases. Um, you might also notice when you look at the statistics that from 2016 to 2017, just overall, there's a little bit of a slowdown, like when you notice how many cases have been opened. What I want to su suggest to you is that's not necessarily a slowdown, that's more of a refocusing. What we've done is we've refocused our efforts in enforcement on health and safety violations, and we've decided not to go forward with or open cases when they were administrative violations <coughs> or matters that could be easily corrected. It doesn't mean per se that we're closing all of those cases, and I still have cases that I intend to go forward on that have some of those types of violations, but we're taking that into consideration. We're looking to see if it's a health and safety issue first and foremost. Those are our primary concerns, and we have limited resources which we can go forward with. So when you look at your case numbers and think, well, why is it decreasing? You know, population's increasing more people than ever are going to schools and using your services. Well, we've got to take that in consideration when we look at the complaints that are coming in, how serious they are. <clears throat> now, the case highlight that I have for you, you see that relates to uh, an instructor, which I explained to you already was pretty common, expired license. This person's license was expired from 2015 at the time when we had the inspection. 
on April 29th. So um, unlicensed for quite a while. We consider it expired license up until three, up to a three-year period, okay? So thank you very much. <clears throat> so just because your license is expired for a day or a week or a month doesn't mean we go after you and treat you as an unlicensed person. However, we don't close the case either just because you get your license. She decided to get her license three days after our inspection. Well, she was still expired for a very long time. We went forward with that case. Charlotte Melder was the one who handled that case. She got an agreed order, uh, which is an order that was signed by uh, Brian Fr Francis, executive director, in order to um, finalize that. She got a $300 penalty. She is <coughs> renewed. She did renew her license. She's currently in good standing with us. But um, that just goes to show that, you know, corrective actions can be taken, but it doesn't mean it annuls the fact that you did something that was a violation in the first place. And uh, that is typical. We try to get corrective actions to be made, whether, whether it is a document that needs to be corrected or a complaint sign that needs to be posted, a license that needs to be renewed. We try to get the corrective action taken in enforcement in addition to proceeding with a violation or a sanction if that's appropriate. Now, I want to commend education and um, especially uh, compliance and Michael Strom. We do collaborate with them uh, uh, very effectively in the review of the cases that we have. And uh, I very much appreciate their time that they spend with us and helping us to understand the program as well. Uh, it's very difficult when you have a lot of different laws and rules for different programs that you have to uh, you know, uh, enforce. And you, we need to have those experts in each one of the programs. Let's see. I would note that if you look at the statistics, as we uh, indicated, there was a decrease in the cases opened and resolved from 2016, a little bit of an uh, increase in the number of agreed orders that are assigned uh, from two to seven. And, and if what I want to explain to you is, or to remind you, is that we do have three types of orders. We have default orders. We have agreed orders. And we have just regular final orders that go through our commission. So the agreed orders are the kind of orders where we come into an, uh, basically an agreement with the respondent, the person who made the violation. And those are signed by Brian. Those type of orders tend to get paid. When people ad come to the table and admit that they've done something wrong, they're more likely to be able to come to terms with the department and get their license in good standing and make the payments that they need to. So you see, we got, we've been pretty successful in collecting those. Uh, you don't expect to have 100% collection rates on those. So that pretty much concludes my report. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them for you. Fantastic report, Ron. Uh, appreciate thank it. Thank you. Great stuff. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I could add, Ron, first of all, you guys have done a great job. I thought you were getting choked up still from the, uh, the OU Ohio State game. I'm feeling sorry for everybody. <laughs> I thought you were still feeling the remnants of that OU Ohio State game. But, um, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, a couple of things to keep in mind um, is that we are continuing to learn the programs and for driver, driver education, driver safety. And so even with the new inspection component, there's, there's a learning curve. And the one thing that I will share with you, and, and just and I think you guys are aware of this, but all the enforcement data that, that Ron and the staff's presenting to you, that's on the web page. So it's not just uh, you guys having access to it, but it's available on the web page. If you go to the um, advisory board section of meetings, if you click on that, you're going to be able to see the minutes from past meetings, the agenda, as well as staff reports. And, and I don't know if, if our friends in towing knew that the staff reports are out there as well. So um, I, I think there's a lot of good data in there, and you can kind of see the trends and how, how we're learning and making mistakes, but then learning and getting smarter and that sort of thing. So just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian. I appreciate that. Uh, any questions, members, before we continue to item five? Item uh, five is the licensing division. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm before sorry. Brian. Uh, Nina Saint, um, am I correct? You said that her license expired in 2015. Ms. Keys, I'm sorry. I should have. Yes, Ron Foster. Yes, yes. that's correct. Um, which brings to mind something that I'm highly concerned about is communication. Because I know Ms. Keys um, for a long time. Um, do we know that there's been communication with every driver education school out there that we're 
the oversight for driver education in the state is at TDLR? I, I would hope that they're aware of it through uh, the numerous listserv messages and the information that's gone out there. Um, particularly on the renewal thing, I believe we began issuing renewal notices to the in, the, inspect, uh, the instructors. That's something that didn't take place before, so there is some awareness Correct. Of that. It did not take yeah. place before, and so um, I don't know. It just brings to mind, because there's a lot of issues, like w whether you had the correct address, whether those schools are communicating with TDLNR, because I think more it's not on your side, it's on some of the school side. That I just have a feeling we still have some out there that just are uneducated I on the process. That. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm kind of concerned of that, brings that concern. Well, I understand that concern. Well, I, I want to say something about that. <laughs> 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 the burden is on the person who's the licensee to make oh, sure I that agree. they're it, not expired. And this person, <laughs> I reviewed that case before I came down here today, and that person did not contest that at, at any time that she was expired. It was, now, whether there's a breakdown somewhere along the line on communication, she no matter had to just look at her license to see that it was expired. And, you know, the fact that it was 2017 and it would have expired on its face from 2015 should have been sufficient evidence to her that she needed to take some action and the burden was on her to reach out and find and, the right and, person. And, right, and do, don't take me wrong, I'm not, I'm not putting it on TDLNR. My concern is we got to keep reaching out the to the industry the and keep reaching out to them. Yes. Yeah. That's my concern to them. I mean, we're, we're two years. Into I think y'all are doing a great job yeah. trying to make the communication. Nina uh, Ray Pizarro, director for education examination. Uh, just to let you, everyone know, my inspectors, their task right now as they go out to the schools and they're doing periodic inspection, their number one task is education. We're educating them as we go out there to do these inspections and letting them know. Because we're, we're going to find things that most of this is audit. And a lot of the things our inspectors are, are they're very uh, educated on how to inspect. All of them are clear trained in, 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 uh, in, in being, doing investigation and inspections. So they know when there's uh, foul play and they know when there's mistakes. And just they just did not know. And so a lot of the times they're going out there just to educate them. And, we, and as Carrie said, you're, you're seeing a lot of the trends. Oh, you did not cross your T's here. You did not your I's. We're not going to you know, go and bring a hammer to them. We're going to say, hey, guys, these are the things you're not doing right. And by rule and law, you need to do them. So we're out there as we go out there introducing ourselves and educating those schools and bringing them up to date so that they're aware of those mistakes. And I have a follow-up comment to that, too. There's quite a bit of discretion that's involved when, when they're inspecting. So when the inspector notes a violation, they don't have to send that in any of our programs. They don't absolutely have to send 100% of their observed violations to the enforcement division. And we don't require our prosecutors to absolutely issue violations on every one of the referred violations that come to us. We can issue, we can close it if we think that the, really the evidence isn't as good as somebody thought it was. We can issue a warning letter if we think that's appropriate because corrective actions were taken. There's, all, there's a range of responses that can happen from the enforcement division. The notice of violation is only one of them. And I, normally we would certainly take into account even if an inspector sent a violation to us that it was an expired license, how long was it? Was it a week? Was it a day? You know, I would take that in consideration, absolutely, and I'm sure Charlotte would too. This was not a situation where a person just had a license for one day or one week that was expired. It was, it was for two years at least. And now we didn't inspect every day, so we don't know how many times that person instructed, but just on the face of it, the one time when we did inspect and the person was there as an instructor, and their license was expired, that was enough for a violation in my, mm -hmm. in my mind. And I, and I agree with Charlotte's conclusion in the case. Is there any further Thank questions? You. <laughs> Thank you. Any follow-ups? Thank you, Ron. Thank you so much. Hello. There we go. <laughs> Item number five, licensing. How are you? Boy? Good morning, Chairman and Board members. Uh, it's been quiet for licensing, so um, <laughs> we have been busy um, learning our new program Chloe, for the. Chloe. Sorry, uh, Mary Winston. I'm sorry, Chloe no. Wayland. I thought I said that. I'm sorry, <laughs> Chloe Wayland, licensing. <laughs> um, so we have been busy learning our new program for the uh, offender education instructors. Um, 
on processing and learning um, that process for about 1,300 um, instructors. We have also been busy making sure that your licenses have been renewed and uh, updated as well. So there's no backlog and everything is going good. I've also had the opportunity to attend um, the drug and alcohol um, pro uh, program for instructors uh, workshop, which was very interesting. So if you guys have any questions on your statistics, please let me know. Is that the licensing? It's for the instructors, yeah. They have to, to be attend. Licensed, yes, not for they have the, to attend an initial workshop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hadn't uh, attended the in-service yet, so. Come see me in November and love okay. it. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Brian Francis, Chloe is uh, in her section. They're the ones that bring to me the uh, unique requests yes. relating to Harvey. So if there's an instructor who has an expired license or working in school, and we found some different ways to, to help people get back up and running uh, as quickly as possible in that regard. Chloe, I had a question in regards to the licenses. Are, 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 is TDR sending the renewal applications to driving uh, schools? They send them to the instructor. Okay, but the driving they, schools are not getting any renewal applications. For the schools? Right. Education? They're not sitting. Is that something that we're going to be doing, or? It seems like something we can do. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be looking into that. Yeah. And uh, what else? I guess that's it. Anybody else? Any questions? Chloe, thank you so You're much, welcome. as always. We appreciate it. You're thank welcome. you. Uh, before I go to item F, <clears throat> Della, is that going to be you? That's yes. Um, I think we could use a break, members? Just we'll take a short recess. Thank you so much. A 10 minute recess, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>
everyone and get started here. If we can. Thank you so much. Hoping everybody enjoyed that quick little break. Thank you so much for your patience, Stella. We're going to get started with uh, item number F, discussion and possible recommendation on proposed rule amendments to 16 Texas Administrative Code. Um, Della? Good morning. Della Lindquist, uh, Deputy General Counsel, and I have Carrie Hodges with me as well to go over this latest rulemaking to kind of bring you back to um, where we've come from because we've come very far, very fast since the two years you've been with us. Um, it was actually three years ago in the fall of 2014 that Ray and I uh, and everybody started working on the bill. So it's really been a pretty intense few years, but um, I've really enjoyed, enjoyed this process. And you've been through one rulemaking earlier in the year, in the summer, and everybody survived. And uh, I congratulate you because it's not easy to go through all of this, your first time being aboard. Um, with a new agency <coughs> and new people, and so I want to commend you on the success that we've had so far. This uh, rulemaking today is part of um, the bills that were passed this past session, and because there were so many and there were so many um, changes, we, divide, we decided to divide the rulemaking timelines into basically two tracks. This is the first track, and it's less intense. It's really dealing with um, the SB. Uh, 912 and 848, which is kind of our housekeeping bill that made some internal changes. Um, mm -hmm. It also incorporated the parent taught expansion and a few other things like that. And then House Bill 1372, which added the child passenger safety seat requirement. So really, um, the conglomeration of those two bills isn't, doesn't add up, add up to a whole lot of substantive changes for you today. Um, as we head into the next phase of the bill rulemaking, it will be more because that will be more curriculum related. We will take up some of the, the comments and things that happened at the previous rulemaking, um, the comments that we weren't able to incorporate back then. And then, of course, um, some of the more, uh, like the, the discussion we're going to have this afternoon about the uh, driving safety and the electronic transfer. And a lot of that will be incorporated in this next rulemaking, which will begin with your March, kind of mid March meeting as you come back. So. Um, it's been going on a long time and it will continue probably another, almost another year till um, August and September of 2018. But, but the plan is by that time to have a package of rules that people are happy with, that are streamlined and, and more usable and incorporating all these new bills too. It's very um, interesting that there were so many bills that affected this program um, this session. Because normally that, that might be one of our higher profile programs, but um, Apparently, driver training has become one of these higher profile programs. So uh, it's, it's good, but it also requires a lot of concentrated effort. So, without further ado, um, hopefully, everybody has read the draft rules that were sent to you. At the end of my presentation today, our presentation, the hope is that you would recommend these to be published for the 30 day notice, uh, public comment. We'll reconvene um, at a later date, and then these rules hopefully will get adopted, and then we'll segue into phase two of the, of the bill changes, which will incorporate the, um, more of the curriculum changes. So these, again, these two bills that we're talking about today, well, three bills really, um, House Bill 912, SB 848, which were identical, and then HB 1372. Um, and if you'd like, I can just go over each one of these. Um, beginning with section 84.2, basically the definition of good reputation we took out of the rules because it was taken out of the statute. And not to alarm anybody in the public, it doesn't mean that we don't really want people with good reputation anymore in the industry. It's just that our, uh, the way we um, examine applications and determine criminal history and all of that stuff really incorporates this and to sort of streamline this uh, process, um, this was a little bit hard to understand and a little bit too broad, and so we feel like bringing it within our purview of how we handle uh, criminal history and all of that would, would accomplish the same thing. So not to alarm people that no more good reputation. Um, so we just struck that definition out of 84.2. And 84.41, let's see. Basically, this incorporates the printing and issuing 
um, issue from the driver education uh, from the bill at SB uh, 848 and 912 struck through the requirement for printing for all of these. Um, so we just struck out any reference to printing and issuing for the driver <coughs> education certificates. They're not struck yet in the safety portion, as you'll see, because we're going to have the discussion this afternoon um, to discuss how to best make those um, safe pursuant to the law. Um, 84.51, we're in the parent top program. Basically, that, that was just a clerical error. If you'll notice that we had um, 1,001.112, I mean, 212, two and it should be 112. So, um, 84.62, the bond was reduced in the bills down from 25,000 to 10,000, so we referenced that in the the rules. 84.70 in the drug and alcohol awareness programs. Again, it's the good reputation uh, language to take <coughs> out. 84.500, where we begin the curriculum portion of the rules, we inserted the proper use of child passenger safety seat systems. Um, in 84.502, driving safety courses of instruction. In, in 1A, we added the proper use of the child uh, passenger safety seat systems and down again in the curriculum minimum course content and number six we added number six uh, proper use of child passenger safety seat systems renumbered that and then in 84.503 and please stop me if you have any questions as we go um, 84.503 we just um, beefed it up a little bit uh, you already had the compliance with the ch child passenger safety systems. We just added the use of. In 84.600, that's the program of organized instruction. We also added in uh, 2B, making sure that we include the proper use of child passenger safety seat systems. I will acknowledge, um, and I wanted to say it on the record before Nina corrected me, we did miss one. Uh, maybe more, but I, I caught one today that we missed pursuant to one of the bills. It's um, when we mail out the renewal notices or when you send in your renewal, renewal notices for driver education instructor, it used to say that it had to be postmarked 30 days before. That was taken out in the bill. We didn't do it in this um, proposal, but we will take it out at the next one. It's in 84.44, so we can discuss that at the next time, but since it's not in this agenda, I really can't discuss it, but I do want to acknowledge that we did miss that. So we won't be requiring it. It's just a hangover from the rules. So I forgive us for that. Do you have any questions? Um, this is Carlos Reyna. Does that mean that if we vote on these, then that one will not be changed? I guess it'll stay until right, the it next, stay the next as go around. Kind of a holdover, but we won't be enforcing it. It won't be enforced it because this, it's taken out of the statute and. Um, so I apologize for that. But if you vote on them today, it would be the ones that we have referenced <coughs> in the agenda. Um, so. Any other questions, members? Should we uh, consider a vote then to uh, move these to get published now? Or if you, we wait? Yes. What, what my goal is today, unless you want any further discussion, is sure. to move to recommend these to be published. And then, of course, we'll meet again after the published in the, the comment and we'll bring the comments if there's any back to you at the next meeting. Absolutely. So I'll consider a motion, members? So moved. Excellent. And we have a motion on the floor to have these published, these are new changes. Do we have a second? I'll second. Nina? Yes. Thank you so much. Nina seconds it. All those uh, in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to add a further thing. The timeline that we're working off of will bring you back before us in February. Is that right, Delia? Um, we're going to publish the rules in December. The public comment period should end towards the end of January. And then we would meet again, I think it's February 7th, 2018, to discuss the comments um, and recommend, hopefully, for adoption by the commission at their meeting, which might be in February, hopefully. And then the rules would be effective March 1st, 2018. And then on our fast track timeline, we would, you would probably be back before us again in mid to late March to begin that, looking at the rules for that second part of track two. 
So we'll be seeing a lot. You'll be seeing a lot of, of us over the next few months. And I also wanted to add that this is probably my last time to present rules to you. Um, my duties as manager with a bunch of new people that we've hired um, probably are ecl eclipsing some of the things I do as GC. So um, I just wanted to say how much fun it's been working with you as a board, as your first board, and all of you, and bringing a new program over. I'll be working with the attorney. He's very experienced. and. Um, I'm sure he's going to do a great job with Carrie and everybody, but I just wanted to say thank you. Thank, thank you for you, your Donna. patience with us pleasure. and bringing the new program over. Thank, so. you. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very thank much. You. Excellent. We'll both do it together. Board members, any questions, any comments before we continue with item G? Anyone? Excellent. Our next item is item G, discussion and recommendation for issuance of a memorial. Are we there yet, Debray? We are. Okay, excellent. Uh, this is a discussion recommendation for issuance of a memorial certificate of recognition by the department. So, Mr. Right? Chairman, as I started out uh, earlier in giving just an overview of our response to Harvey, um, you know, when you lose somebody that's part of the, uh, the driver education school family, we all lose someone. And uh, Coach Jordan was somebody that, that touched a lot of folks. And what we want to do is to come to the board and, and say at our next meeting, we would like to put together a memorial certificate that honors him. Uh, we'll try to reach out to his family and, and friends and have them here. But uh, we just think it's important to, um, to recognize uh, you know, the contributions, but also those folks that we, we've lost in this situation. Now let Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Kerry so, Hodges. Thank you, Brian. Education exam. I was fortunate enough to actually speak to his daughter. Uh, they are taking over the Friendswood Driving School. As you all know, Mr. Jordan, or Coach Jordan, as he was known, was in driver education. He was first licensed in 1992, and he's been doing driver education, obviously, for many, many years. His daughter's good. His family's good. Obviously, they're still reeling from the shock, but we are really excited to bring this to you guys for hopeful the, the 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 recommendation to offer their certificate we are very well aware that he had well he had the three different locations for friendswood and all of them are being taken care of as of this time uh, we were really grateful to his daughter for reaching back out to us because we we, we did make that initial contact and she's looking forward to uh, continuing his <coughs> legacy in the school and continue to, to um, instruct our, our youth in driver education. So we're looking forward to that. So, Mr. Chairman, we just wanted to let you know that that's something that we'll have at the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you absolutely, Brian. I really appreciate that. I, I'm definitely going to consider a motion uh, for issuance of that memorial certificate. Members? I move. Thank I'll you, move. Carlos, so much. We have a motion on the floor. Second. I'll Excellent. Uh, we have uh, Cindy and Sam seconding that on the floor. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries <coughs> to issue a memorial certificate for Coach Jordan. What was the name of the driving school? Friendswood Driving School. Friendswood Driving School. Yes. Thank you so much. I think that's fantastic. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, members. Absolutely. Moving on to the next item, item H, the beginning of driver training and traffic safety education summit led by Ray, uh, the director of education examination. Ray, are you ready? Mr. Chairman, if we could take yes. just a slight break, we're going to rearrange the room yeah. uh, so it can be configured a little differently. You're going to be able to stay there, but uh, we're going to use the smart board and, and have Ray do his best uh, impression of a talk show host <laughs> sure. in a second. Um, <laughs> as we move forward with this, I, I want to emphasize that, and, and I'm really proud of the staff for, for getting this done, but we, we want to do more of these summits. We've got folks here, we've got the wisdom of the crowd, and having everyone present to, to really engage in these type of discussions is going to be critical. So you'll see uh, more summits, and it may be a very specific question that's a little hairy, but it'll allow for dialogue and exchange. Um, you know, Mr. Bruce and Glenn knows that you know, we talked about this specifically, uh, that we were not going to and will not move forward with any changes on the uh, online distribution of those certificates for driver safety until we all get comfortable with how it can be done right. And this is the beginning of that process. Uh, what we do today will build that foundation. It's not going to make the change day. It's going to build and start the dialogue for that. And I just wanted to let you guys know that 
we're going to honor that conversation we talked thank about. Thank you. Thank you very much. So probably about 10 minutes, uh, and we're going to kick you folks out of your seats for just a little bit as we rearrange the room. Okay. <laughs> we're in recess then for a few minutes. Excellent.
Hello. There, there we go. go. Hello. Excellent. Good morning, everybody. Ray Pizarro, Director of the Education Examination Division. Carrie Hodges, ex ex Education and Exam with Driver Education and Safety. So this is our second summit. And I'm sure maybe you guys have questions off the top of your head. What's going on? What are we going to do? What's the purpose? So I just want to quickly, before we start the presentation here, uh, we want to gather, the whole purpose is to gather information from you guys. This is going to be interactive. It's not just going to be us talking. We're going to seek information from you. Uh, Ford over here, Michael, is going to be jotting down your comments. So we'll pause at times because we need to get exactly what your comments are so he can write them down and we can go back to the drawing board and make adjustments if needed. Um, we want to know the best way to prevent fraud. You know, this new bill, the, the law that came into place on certificates. So we just don't want to implement something without your input. So we want to know, hey, you guys have been doing this long enough. Tell us what you know and what you don't know. And remember, all of the information we're gathering, and we're going to talk about also the website on the search tool, how that works. Remember, TDLR's perspective, we're here to make sure that the customer, that mom in Hudspeth County, out in El Paso, can come to the TDLR website and seek whatever they need from us in order for her to do her business with her children or his children. See what I'm saying? We want to know what are those best clicks. It's, the website is all about the customers that come to our website that we serve. So keep that in mind when you're providing these comments. We're, ta we're talking big pictures, guys. This is for the entire industry. What's the best way it can serve? And we're going to gather that information. You're going to hear Carrie uh, asking a lot of these questions and, and basically prompting you. It's not, we don't want to be the, the, the ringleader on how this is going to go down, but we need to help, you need to help us understand how it works on your end. So we can put it together and provide that good information for those folks. I've always said in other presentations I've done and people that w we, we talk to and visit, customer service, that's one of our core priorities. And it's one personally for me. I do not like calling AT&T. Does everybody have AT&T? Uh, anytime I have to pick up the phone, I I'm like dreading it. God, do I need to be on the phone with these people to try to get what I want? That's what we don't want to be. We don't want to be that guy. We don't want to be people here calling TDLR, calling Carrie, calling myself. We can't get this. That's what we're trying to avoid. We're trying to make it simple, the least amount of clicks to get to where we need to be. Exactly. So what we're going to, with that said, well, we're going to. Well, I'm sorry. Before you start, one more other thing. Sorry. Go ahead. Respect everybody's opinions and comments. That's this one. Yep. Oh, got you got you. it right I here? I got you. Got these it. are basically, guys, these are the ground rules. Uh, we're going to go back to kindergarten, first grade. Do, us, do, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Respect the thoughts. There is no silly idea. There's no crazy idea. There, there are, but we know that. But we want your honest input, but be respectful of everybody else that's putting an input around you. Are we all in agreement on that one? Thank you. Of course, be respectful of time constraints. I don't know about y'all, but I have plans this evening, and I don't want to be here till 8 o'clock tonight. So be respectful of time constraints. Keep comments and suggestions, one, relevant to the topic, please, and make sure that we condense them. There are so many great stories in this room. I've sat and had dinner with a few of you and had some really great stories that really truly helped me understand this program as itself. Not now. We don't have the time. Like, if you want to email me that, that story, I'll be more than happy to read it. But we just don't have the time today. So uh, we would respect that if you respect that. So moving on to the actual overview on, on what we're doing today. I'm not sure if any of you are aware, for the first part of this, we're going to be talking about electronic certificates. If you are not aware, during legislative session, there was actually a uh, committee meeting. Mr. Bruce was there. Director Francis was there. And they spoke in front of a committee about the electronic delivery of certificates for driving safety program. One promise that Brian made to Rep. Taylor, which we are upholding, which is we want your input. How can we deliver this certificate or put procedures in place to have 
the course providers deliver the certificate in the most secure fashion but electronically without doing an actual paper certificate because we know we are in an age of instant gratification you know as well as I do these folks don't get this stuff taken care of until this ticket taken care of until like two three days sometimes not even like the day before and I need the certificate now and so this is the things that we're going to talk about who's eligible to issue and who's eligible to re eligible to receive the actual document the the actual delivery itself, what procedures, and then the implementation of, what, what timeline are we, do we want to look at to have this done. Please keep this in mind that this bill became effective immediately. And so we are definitely trying to make sure that we get this done as soon as possible. The last part of it, of course, will be the new page design for the DES search tool. That is for the driving safety online programs only. If you have an online program, we want your input. If you don't have an online program, we want your input. But if, you're, if you have a traditional course and you don't give a flying whatever it, what the page looks like, you don't have to stay. We realize you have businesses to run and things to do today, so you're more than welcome to stay for that portion of it. But we will let you know, okay, we've done this. We're going to move into this side of it. So Those design uh, proposals, you're going to see uh, some pros and cons. You're going to see ideas where internally and talking with RITs where we've, we've come up with ideas. This is not etch in stone. There may be other pros and there may be other cons and you guys need to point that out to us and Michael's going to write those down. I don't want you to think that these, these proposals, what we've done is, is already completed. These are just, we, we started the idea. We like to bring draft to everyone just like you see when we bring draft rules to, to, the, to, the, to, the, or to the industry. We want to we wanna start somewhere. So we brought this to the table and we want to hear from you. So once we get this started, we really need, I'll be walking around and bringing the mic, make sure we want to have these, everything recorded and people need to hear you, so please state your name, uh, just like in the, in the in advisory board, because this is still convened as a public meeting. So state your name and, uh, and then provide your comment. Moving on. So issuing and accepting electronic certificates. Traditional course providers and online, of course, would be eligible to issue an electronic certificate once we get to that point. That's the easy part. Y you're, you're eligible to. If you have a course provider license and you currently issue the paper certificate, you would be eligible to issue an electronic certificate. We're going to discuss how and what are our best procedures we feel and you feel would cover that. It would be an option, not a requirement. You're not required to do this. It would, of course, again, still just be an option. You can continue ordering the paper, or creating the paper certificates and issuing those, getting numbers from us. However you feel would work best for your business. The largest part of this is not all courts, well, courts, first of all, are not required to accept an electronic certificate. You would want to, that would be your job on the back end is to go and see and to find out which courts will accept an electronic certificate. It is their discretion. Now, once we come up with these procedures, everything's set in stone, we're, we're good to go, we have this, we will actually reach out to the judicial system as well as the Department of Public Safety and let them know, hey, this is our new plan, these are what they will look like. You're more than welcome to accept them, it's up to you as a court. And so again, how many counties do we have? We have 251. 251. 251 counties. Some of these, we were in the meeting last week, they said we have the, the, the sheriff is also the judge, that's also the lawnmower, that's also the pastor. We know that we have tiny counties. So you have to be very well aware that there will be some counties that say, no way, I want it in paper. So you'll have to make sure to keep that customer in mind when we, when we talk about these things. So really, I mean, we're going to get right into the discussion. We'll start with what are the cons of an electronic certificate? Michael, we're going to, that's going to be our first one. At you, buddy. So uh, what are the cons? And we'll, we'll keep those, let's try to keep uh, each discussion point so he has an opportunity to write those and then we'll go to the next one. Somet if we have to, if we're down to bullet four and something comes to mind on bullet one, just make sure that your comment is, a j make sure you, you state that your comment is to address whatever bullet point that is so he can jot it down correctly in, in, the, in the right area. So anyone, we want to start there. What are, what are the cons of uh, electronic certificate? Come on, you guys are a talkative group. None. 
Really? Bill? Seriously? <laughs> and board members, we definitely, uh, committee member, we, we welcome your comments as well. We want to hear from you yes. as well as everybody else in the audience. Okay, sure. Bill Blasting game. Uh, my comment would be I'm concerned that with courts not, our courts having an option of accepting it, that there would be some issues where courts would uh, just have partiality towards certain providers. So how would the agency deal with that? Am I in the, am I in the con part of the electronic certificate? Well, I, I don't, let me say this. I don't want to uh, turn the meeting into a no, no, Q and A. I, I'm okay. with you, but I want to get your thoughts. And okay. if that's what we're just going to put, I'm, we're, okay. I don't, I don't think we're going to be prepared well, to the, answer all of these and get I think into the, the discussion. Con of this, the, the electronic certificate the, would be okay. courts not, and we'll put that down. Okay, show them, and then show partiality us, towards certain providers sure. and other and others, and let us chew on it, and then we'll come back. Gotcha. With, that would be my con. Okay, right. thank you, Bill. Mine would be more procedure. Kenneth Cope, mine would be more procedure. What, what will the electronic certificate look like? And we're going to get. We'll we'll definitely cover that. That's actually one of the one of the points. Okay. Any other cons on this one? Uh, yes, Bruce. David Bruce. Um, so, uh, I guess m my comments are for the cons. There's a, there's some pros and cons to this whole process. We happen to start off on the cons, but it, it's how to control the look of the electronic certificate so the student. Uh, cannot easily change the certificate so they can use it repeatedly. I know there's no bulletproof mechanism, uh, but the con is not to make it easier than it already is. I mean, I think this agency and the previous agencies have done a good job trying to prevent that with a paper certificate. Uh, so that's one great uh, con in my opinion. The other con is how to control, even if the student doesn't manipulate the look of the certificate, how a court across the 251 counties knows what it's supposed to look like. If you start giving each course provider the ability to change the look and feel, although it will be approved by the TDLR at least once, if that student does need to print off that certificate to hand it to the court, we all have home printers. Some are black and white, some are in color, some have really bad paper, some have great paper, some print sideways. How do you control that? I think there's mechanisms to do that. But that's part of the process that I think we need to iron out. But those are two big cons in my I opinion. think so. I agree with that. One second. Michael, you got? Okay. Uh, Eric Brown. I, I have a question that's more related to this. Is there an existing problem that exists? I mean, yeah, I guess an existing problem that exists. Is there an existing issue with fraudulent certificates? I mean, are we trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist is my question. I mean, is there any known issue with people making fraudulent certificates? <laughs> Because so we get calls all the time that people say, are you an approved school? As if there's a series of unapproved schools that are <laughs> on a list someplace that they're getting a number from. You know what I mean? I mean, it's just a bizarre question. I, I, I don't know. Is there a problem with fraudulent <coughs> certificates that's known or unknown or so, otherwise? So um, remember, the, the bill that went into law is for us to implement the electronic certificate. I understand. So I want to try, I, I, I don't know the answer to those, but, the, but I want to keep on task of let's, let's iron some of these things out because at the end of the day, we, the TDLR, is going to have to do something to put into place. And our goal is we don't want to put something in, into place or put something on paper and make some policies and make some procedures and change some rules and we go down the wrong direction. So the whole, I, the whole thing, as Kerry was saying, with uh, the, what was mentioned to Brian Francis, and he made that commitment to say, hey, we're going to do it right the first time. And we're going to get you guys to tell us, let's make sure there aren't any fraudulent, or if there is, how do we prevent those things? And these are the kind of what we want to gather so that we make sure whatever we put in place, or however that writing may be, those words on paper in the rule, is uh, the right thing, if that makes sound. But you had something. I was just going to clarify for him. But, maybe okay. but that's a good question. We've actually jotted that down that way. That's one of the things that we can think of when we're, yeah. Robert Cardenas. Um, 
the, the con, I think, where we experience is when a student maybe has to have three different course classes, has three different courts where they can just print one and then how are they gonna, they can manipulate two other courts there and that's where they just do one and then three other ones and then, so when they call and ask, they have to take three different classes. But they always say, well, can't you just print me another one? Print me? Well, now that they have access that they can print themselves one, they can just, you know, white out one court and put on another court. Good, good point. Mara Cardenas, and I'm, I'm again with what Mr. Bruce had said, the con of the certificates. I feel anyone who's tech savvy can really manipulate these kind of um, certificates to look like the, uh, another one and, and reproduce it. Um, maybe one idea would be any electronic certificate that's issued has a specific little unique code to every single one and only only the they do oh okay well the certificate number yeah they are unique which is good okay but there I think there are even additional things because I, I even myself have some ideas because uh, I've thought about this because mm -hmm. this is what obviously I do so please continue good um, yeah that that's just a, con a concern for me um, also another would be the students not knowing whether or not their court will accept it so I know course providers need to be aware which courts will accept an electronic document, um, but the questions will continue. They're going to always call and be asking those kind of questions. Like, can the courts make it very, very clear to them? You know, I, I don't know when their ticket is issued, or can the courts make it very clear to them that they accept electronic certificates? So, definitely. Just, just a yes, sir. Sorry, I, David Bruce, I have one more I thought it would be addressed, but the, the other concern is the identity of the student, uh, meaning identity theft. We all know the sensitive data that is actually on the certificate, your driver's license number, your home address. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's exactly what people are dying to get a hold of. And of course, providers, and I will pause, I know we can come up with procedures to address this, but of course, pro providers don't have the right procedures and they're sending out hundreds of thousands of of certificates via email not protected I think that that hurts the industry can certainly hurt our, our customers or hurts the TDLR so that's a, a real risk because yes. that is everything a person needs to take someone's identity so good when point, coming up good with good ahead. procedures we need to make sure that's that's one of the things that we need to think about is protection of, of personal information okay so to to move on to the cons, I mean, I'm sorry, to the pros, uh, if there are no more cons, but think about it. We can always go back up to the first bullet. Okay, Not a problem. Brian, again, l let's, let's hover around the cons a little bit more. Sure. Uh, being the nerd that I am, I spent an hour and a half yesterday, and I do have a life, but I was watching the, um, uh, the hearings for Equifax and listening to their CEO, Mr. Smith, talk about uh, the breach and the incident and the accident. Uh, that PII is a real critical piece here. Um, I would say that the con is also figuring out what the courts want uh, and trying to come up with a system that will meet most of their needs and recognizing they won't meet all of their needs. So meeting the courts where they are, that, that system, what are they on, what type of systems do they have, and so we'll obviously be reaching out to the judicial branch to have conversations with them. Uh, we're not just going to tell them what our solution is. We're going to bring them in as partners in this process. But I will just tell you frankly, we don't have enough cons up there yet. So we're going to stay on this one. Y'all going to have to be Talk creative or, or you're going to have to pull out a pillow or a knapsack. But there are more ideas of things that could go wrong than what's been iterate, um, spoken about. So. And that was Brian Francis, executive director. Yeah, that guy. <laughs> <laughs> He's such a jerk when he doesn't say his name. That guy, man. Kenneth Cope. And whenever you mentioned about a code and you said, well, the certificate is a code, and then we were talking about, well, somebody could manipulate. That court, if that person had three tickets and you sent them an electronic certificate and you've got a number on it, and then they alter it to where they put another court on it and send it out to the, the other, another court, that court's not going to know. He's not going to be able to identify with that number. It's just, hey, I get this. I, I'm going to tell you, I've had a student that tried to manipulate, you know, wanted a duplicate and I called the court on him, you know, to find out, hey, he's already received this, 
and he wanted it for another one. He wanted me to change it out. You know, so I know that they're out there thinking like that, but that court won't know that this is that particular certificate for this particular person, even if you send it to another court in San Antonio or Houston or wherever. You know, it's, he got one certificate number with a different court, and they, they just send it in, think it's okay. They record it. But is there any, any checks and, and balances there, you know, as far as would that number come back fraudulent some way, you know, through your organization? So would you, would you say um, there needs to be some better communication with uh, TDLR and DPS? Yes. Uh, is there, system. do they need to make some, does DPS need to make some changes on their end? Uh, so if someone is, um, let's say, once that certificate is logged in in their system and somebody attempts to try to copy it, for example, what you're saying, and they resubmit that, it, there, it, there needs to be some type of security there or some systems or some some something done on their end? Yeah. Uh, check laws. Uh, I understand where Ken's coming from. It's maybe something as simple as on the certificate, court which this is, which is, this is to be issued. Uh, I'm not, in, dri I, I'm not in, in driving safety, so I'm just going to listen. We have that. Do you? Yeah, but see, if somebody was going to be manipulating, you yeah. know. I'm sorry, we have that. Because if somebody's manipulating and they've got one, I have sent them a certificate and it's got a control number on it, you know, and so he manipulates the court. That's all he does. He changes the court, you know, and he sends the same certificate with that same number. You know, he could send that to two or three different courts and the courts are not, they don't, they don't have a clue if that's accurate or not. So there need to be some methodology to, to uh, secure the accuracy of of or, or the one-time use, yeah. however and that may be for the certificate. And one thing we could also think of is the uh, data upload that's done monthly. We could utilize that data. The, the court systems can log on to that and we can add additional information. There's, I think there are a lot of ways that we could actually address that particular concern because I know that that's one of the largest concerns. We heard that from a judge during the, during the committee meeting. We've heard that from any driving safety course provider. As you all know, for drive, those of you that don't know, driving safety and driver education are required by statute to issue or to submit to us on a monthly basis their, who they issued a certificate to and what certificate number was issued to that student. And so that's definitely a, an avenue to, to look at when we're looking at actually trying to lock down the certificate and make sure that it's not being issued to multiple courts, meaning if the court logs in and, and sees who that certificate was actually issued to, it'd be, uh, it would be a large change, but it's something that, that we could definitely look at. Mara Cardina, so that was my question. So will, will courts be able to access something to, to view a certificate? Exactly. Any, any okay. It's actually public information. Okay. It's on our website right now that you can go to the statistics and uh, look at the current upload that is, that's, that's very current. And it would show, um, right now it only shows what, how, many, how many were actually completed. It would probably, it wouldn't be a, I wouldn't think that it would be a public system. It's something we'd have to talk, talk to our, T, uh, our IT team about, but it's something that courts would have exclusive access to, to look up uh, to see if something's been done. I know they do that, something similar to that with DPS, and we could do that. Cindy. When, when we pull somebody's in. Sorry, who are you again? I'm sorry, Cindy Joni. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when we pull somebody's MVR, it always states this ticket was removed by driving safety course. Why couldn't it just stamp the number and the place at the same time on it so that there's reciprocity with DPS and the courts and TDLNR, and we all have the three same checks and balances our government set up on? That's a great idea. Did you get that? Did you get that? Yes. Chirak Patel, uh, one of the possible solution would be to have a, uh, an email address or a website address at the bottom of the certificate that if a court clerk wants to verify, they can go to the website or email the provider asking whether this is a, a real certificate or fake one. Um, when they go to the website, they can put in person's driver's license or date of birth or any of the couple of information and it would show actually this is the court it was taken for, this is the date that was completed, this is the uh, TDLR issued certificate number. Um, second thing I, I guess that would reduce the fraudulent is that right now we have to upload certificates every 30 days. If you can somehow make that 
a uh, little bit less. Um, at least that way, if someone gets a ticket back to back, let's say within a week, and if that person does determine that I can use the same certificate twice, at least the system will somehow catch that. I'm not sure if there is a procedure in place right now, but I would think that would be helpful. Uh, Eric Brown, uh, addressing one of your issues with duplicate certificates, we deal with that a lot. I mean, I'm sure you do too. We force the student to prove to us that they haven't used the court copy. Uh, we do that a, a number of different ways, um, having them show proof that it's been voided, um, sending us the original back before we'll issue a, a duplicate. Because you know that some people are doing exactly what he's saying. They get multiple citations and because of the overlap and timing, they're able to do the course because it's not going to show up on their driving record until after they s submit it. Um, but I really like the idea here about uh, having a verification process for the court. If you could, and, and, and I don't really want to put an undue board burden on the, on the uh, providers, but if as part of the requirement in order to issue a, a, an electronic certificate and maybe to give a little bit of comfort to the courts, if the providers were required to provide some kind of facility where they could log in and verify the, the authenticity of a specific certificate that it was issued for that specific court and really providing little other information because you wouldn't want to get into information about, um, I don't know, m more detail about the, the consumer, but you could have a login that's, that each site or each school would have to provide and then the courts, if they had any question about that certificate, they could they could use it. I mean, that's probably the best idea I've heard, you know, and, and I've thought about some of these, like how do, you, how do you guarantee it's authentic? But at the end of the day, you would need uh, consistency and communication well, from all entities to yeah, ensure. I mean, uh, yeah, you would, I mean, it's, I think if you're, if you're really wanting to implement some kind of security protocol, which is your step three that we're bypassing <coughs> number two for, but the only way to do that is to force the providers to provide some kind of intermediate facility for the courts to verify, especially if they're going to be able to opt out because that's going to be a major pain. Um, now, ultimately, a better solution would be if the TDLR provided some kind of facility <laughs> and then we could all interface with that and then it would be more like the California DMV. But in, in this respect, it, that, that, that would be the, I mean, unless y'all don't want to do it, you know. Yeah. Well, and this is Brian Francis. In fact, there is a statutory charge that says we will develop a platform and explore electronic dissemination and transmission of information to the municipal and, and justice courts. So uh, that's something you guys heard me talk about early on when the program got here. That this is something we have to look at. Carlos Wayne. And this <coughs> fits into that. Brian, that's been in place for 27 years I know. and we're still waiting. Well, I, I'm going to be tw I'm going to be 27. Okay. I'm gonna be, I'll tell you that right now. Carrie, I have a clarification question. You made a comment about driver education having to submit their certificates or that data. Is that uh, It's not currently in place. <coughs> okay, I was about to say row row. It's not currently in place. It's um we'll cross that bridge when we get there what we're looking at it. So, it's not in place. You will be given ample notice before if and when that comes to pass. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, Jim McCabe, <laughs> I'm just going to address what you were saying. With driver education, I don't, uh, the con, I don't see the, the use of an electronic certificate. The kids have to surrender the certificate to the Department of Public Safety, and it's not, they never pull it out again and use it again once they've surrendered and they're licensed. Uh, are you guys referring to electronic certificates for like defensive driving? This is just driving safety because okay. driver, driver education, driver's education already utilizes this process because of things like that. Uh, they've been issuing electronic certificates for a while now and there is a, there is a fail stop within the DPS system that once that, <coughs> that uh, number is entered, it will notify DPS, the, the actual personnel there, if the certificate is used twice. Trust me, we have some PTD course providers that have had issues with duplicate certificates that weren't really duplicate because of maybe typing in issues or, or whatnot. Uh, but that is a fail-safe <coughs> already for driver education. That's why it was easier to go forward. There is unfortunately not a fail-safe for driving safety for that particular process. Now, it would actually be, it would be my thought, and, and I, we'd have to clarify with DPS, but we would, 
if it would be caught on the back end, if they submit the same certificate for three different courts, it would be caught once that is transmitted to the department to put on their, their history. So that's, but <coughs> at that point, what do you do? I failed to mention, if there's a comment that Bill may have said or anyone may have said, and that is your same thoughts and feelings, please say it again because he's going to record it and we want to see how many folks are saying the same thing and the same kind of ideas are we on the right track. So don't dismiss what you have to say. Make sure you go in and say what you need to say and we will record everything that, that, that you're, you're bringing to us. Any other cons, please? Glenn Winningham. Um, obviously, everybody's main concern here is fraud, okay? It's my opinion that, that if you're going to be doing electronic certificates, it's, you have to accept that, that there's going to be fraud on them because everybody's tech savvy and anyone can make or recreate anything that the TDLR, you know, is going to implement. I mean, let's just say that there's a standardized certificate template that's made that has little identifiers on it, whether they're objects or numbers or whatever you want it to be, okay? As soon as those are printed out by somebody's home printer, any of that can be duplicated. So it would be my opinion that it, say that all the standards get put into place, the, the best way to be able to prevent fraud would be, which they're not going to, I don't think that they'll like, is, is forcing the court systems that when they get an electronic certificate, that they have to cross check it with a database, which brought up that TDLR creates that will basically have the name of the individual, their DL, the course provider, and the cert number. Once that's entered, it has to know that TDLR's database knows what cert numbers were sold to what providers. So that's one check, okay? Then that wipes out that individual certificate number from existence, basically. So if they go and try to use that certificate at another court with that same number, it's going to bounce back, okay? It's, it's, it's not going to be valid. If they try to use it with a different provider or a different anything, it's going to bounce back because they already entered in that information at one time. Um, I, but my issue with that is is forcing the courts to do that to, to basically prevent fraud. They, they, don't, they don't have time to do that on thousands of certificates. And, and, and you're right. It, it is, at the end of the day, going to be a check and balance. The, in my opinion, this is nothing new. We buy concert tickets. We buy stuff online. You don't see people coming into it with the same ticket twice because they're doing their check and balances. So it can be done. And, they're, 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 and I think a lot of folks have, have already mentioned that it's going to take a, a, a group effort, as you're saying, a, a communication effort and a check and balances from all parties. Yeah. And I think that's where we need to be because you're, uh, you're exactly right. No matter what you put on there, it needs to be checked. Sure. And because if, if I can add one more thing real quick. Yes. I, if to, I think to make it, which has already been brought up as well, to make it best for everyone, I, I do believe that there, the system that has is supposed to be put in place for hundreds of years or 27, where we report less than a monthly basis to the TDLR, TDLR reports that information to the courts and to the DPS. So that's best for the consumer, that's best for the course providers, that's the best way to, to do it in my opinion. Carlos Reina. Um, yes, sir. In Florida, they have a system similar to that where the course provider is provided to the state agency and the state agency in real time produces the numbers that are needed and can be checked by the court and verified and null and voided and do all the system by looping you all in the middle. And I think that was the, the whole purpose of that language that was put in the statute already. So I really think it's something should be considered. And we have. We've actually um, had those conversations with DPS. They were put on hold because we had everything else to go through. Uh, but it's definitely still on the table. Um, I will point out to poke the bear <laughs> and to be that devil's advocate. When we first started talking about this, I went to Amazon 
and I looked up how much it would cost me to do Amazon Prime. If you don't have a grid, it's great. Uh, if, if you go to Amazon Prime or Amazon, within two days, I can have security paper delivered to my house. So I just, I want that thought to be in the back of your head when we think about the security of this. There is just as much risk with paper security as there is with an electronic certificate. I just want, I just want to point that out, not to say one is better than the other, because I have no dog in this fight. For me, it's whatever the agency says and whatever we decide and to, and to enforce that. But think about those things when we look at driver education and driving safety, these certificates, I think a stack of 500 security paper certificates in triplicate was like $80 at most. And so it's just think about these things when we're thinking about how can we secure these because we want to make sure that all certificates are secure, whether it's driver education and driving safety because the fraud aspect, it is real. We know that. And what can we do to prevent it? Yes, sir. Sir, I was said. I think uh, if you guys start worrying about hackering and fraud and the data breach, just like that guy was saying over there, you will not do anything. You will just stop right now. You have to start. Just like most all the schools now, we have universities, schools, colleges, they require or they ask sometimes for unofficial transcripts. They go ahead and they process it, and some companies, they accept an official transcript. In case, if they want official transcript, they get an official transcript. So having a certificate with a, with a special number, with a special expiration date in it, like after 24 hours, you cannot reprint it again. And that, that really, that's the end of it. And if the judge has any doubts about the certificate, he can request an official transcript, an official certificate from you guys. Otherwise, he can accept it. He can evaluate the person in front of them, and they can tell if he is genuine or not. Bill Blassingame, I, I wouldn't agree with this right here. <laughs> you kind of beat me to the punch here. Uh, I think when we see electronic certificates, we're kind of looking at a new paradigm, and really we're not. We're just basically doing the same thing we've always done. I mean, we scan this thing in or put it in a PDF file and they print it off on a piece of white paper. It's opening up to the, the court to accept it. <coughs> so I, to me personally, I think that if we just move forward with using our own existing certificates that are already approved through the TDLR, scan them in, send them to the student that wants it electronically, let them print it off, and then begin to solve the problems as they come along. When there are issues, then let's go start addressing those. I think what we may be trying to do is try to keep from anything ever happening. You know, it's like uh, trying to teach your kid how to ride a bike. You can put them in bubble wrap, but eventually you're going to skin their knees. Okay? And so maybe that's where we're at right now. Don't realize it. Good comment. Um, it, as I'm sitting and listening, my name is Cindy Joe Newland, sorry. <laughs> as I'm sitting and listening to all the commentary, um, being the educator that I am, I'm thinking back the same kind of secure site like SBEC has. I don't hand my, I don't hand my teaching certificate to the new district that I go to. Instead, they get on and search for my certificate according to, and they have <coughs> their own <coughs> secure log on for that. So if I were going to a court, my, my translation of that would be, I hand them an affidavit that says, yes, I finished this at this location. And so it, there, there's several checks and balances for, they were at drive trainers and it was under the American Safety Council and it was certificate number blah, 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 or on date such and such. And then the court goes in, should they want that, they go into the secure site and see the database and did you actually issue that control number to American Safety Council who earmarked it for drive trainers or they can go without the official transcript if they want, you know. But that, that means one major database that has several different cross um, checks that TDLNR would would allow courts to use or not. And so it would be a whole different process rather than handing a certificate that can be altered. I teach digital design. 
you can make anything look like anything <laughs> um, with Adobe Photoshop. Um, but there's all kinds of different problems with worrying about scanning a certificate in rather than having a secure database, which is where Equifax is, you know, crisscrosses with that. But at the end of the day, what, what I've been hearing so far is that there needs to be a check and balance somehow. I mean, I think that's a general consensus, right, Ford, you've been writing down? There needs to be some check and balance between the All parties, the regardless on how you're doing it. Nina? Uh, yes, Nina Saint. Um, I guess I'm going to vote for following statute. Amazing. Uh, but <laughs> I do have a couple questions to indicate why maybe that needs to happen. Does anybody have an idea of what the population of people taking driving safety courses a year is? A little bit over. Be correct. Now, does anybody have any idea of how many certificates the courts are, have accepted for somebody taking driving safety a year? I'm going to venture that you may have that information. No, because oh. it's not available. Because <laughs> each court does their own thing, right? And we have, we talked about the county. The county courts are usually JPs, but we also have city courts for every city in, mm -hmm. in our state and so forth. So what we need, as you said, the check and balance because we know what is issued because we have that number from TDLNR. But somebody asked about fraud and what's fraud's going on. We got to know or have some guess that somebody's out there designing certificates with numbers because they know how many digits should be there and never purchased anything from TDLNR, aren't even a course provider, but are selling it to the public and we have no idea what the courts have accepted. So the database, as statute indicates, would help with a lot of different issues on this. And I'm, uh, I'm almost positive we could actually get that number. It wouldn't be from us, though. It would actually be from the Department of Public Safety uh, because they put that information on driving history. Don't know how long it would take, but it's something that we could um, look at. So under adjudication, Again, there are two parts to the Code of Criminal Procedures, and under one of them, that may not be being reported to That's the right. DS. That's very true. Yeah. Because, this, because under adjudication, it never becomes a ticket. An actual conviction, yeah. Under the second section, it is, but under adjudication, just saying. Okay. What else do we think, guys? Michael Strong. Um, much of what Nina is saying, there are all the, all, also other issues with relying on the court to send information back to us, which um, at DPS there were issues with some jurisdictions not reporting anything back to the Department of Public Safety. Um, we know that these courts are incredibly busy. There was a whole lawsuit and, and many issues that came out of uh, certain jurisdictions for that exact re reason. So uh, that may be something that's increasingly difficult or impossible to rely on that court to report data back to us. Because I, we do know for a fact that there are some court systems, whether how, usually the smaller ones, they don't do anything electronically. They don't even have computers because that's just not what they do. Be a small county, you know, six people in the county. So, I mean, so that would be, uh, but again, this goes back to it would be optional for the course provider and for the court to issue the, the certificate electronically, so. More cons? Come Any on. other thoughts on that? I knew it, Eric, I knew it. I actually don't have any cons, I like this. Like, I, I can just tell you from our, Eric Brown, <laughs> I can just tell you from our experience, you may or may not be aware that we briefly issued electronic certificates, but then we're chastised. <laughs> However, we have a little bit of experience in this in terms of what issues came up, and we always said, no, I mean, we asked for permission, and they said it was okay as long as we mailed a certificate. We mailed a certificate, but we issued electronic as well. And the issues that came up were any court that had a question, they call, and they, they would call us. I mean, they, we had a couple of courts, and they were like, okay, sure, it was fine. Other courts, like Temple, was not so gracious. 
<laughs> but um, I don't know. I, I'm sort of losing my train of thought. But the, the issues that we came up with were that, and, and you're going to come up about with this issue regardless. It was something that, you know, caught my mind. But when we issue a certificate, it's on, let's say, a blue pantograph paper. We could at any time decide that we're going to change it to yellow or, you know, pink or something like that. And the issue wasn't so much that they were – that some of the courts don't even know. I mean, because all the certificates are different. I've seen white, yellow, you know, a carbon copy. Um, ours is, you know, a three-part pantograph paper. With, with So the issue was is it looked different to the court. And, and so you have this training issue with clerical staff at the courts because I have students that would say – they say they won't accept it. And my argument would be, well, that's not their job. Their job is the clerical staff. The judge can decide not to accept it, but the clerical staff doesn't really have any say so. You know what I mean? I mean, they're, an, they're, they're just administrators. They, they're not a legal authority when it comes to accepting or not accepting certificates. And that's a problem that I could see if we ever decided, okay, even in the paper issuance, that we're going to change it to pink because pink check stock is, is less expensive or something that we would all of a sudden start issuing these certificates and the court would say, or, you know, some clerk would say, well, I don't want to accept it because it's, it's always on blue stock. You know what I mean? The con is going to be the fact that it's a new issue and that you've got these courts that, I don't know, they're kings of their little pond and you've got JP courts that say, I want the judge's name on it when the judges could change. We get that call a lot. People call all the time. It says it has to have the judge's name on it. Well, Okay. We don't print the judge's name on it. We print what JP's, you know, um, whatever it is, section, I don't know, county, county whatever, precinct, precinct one, place one. Yeah, so the issue, the con is going to be that issuing the certificates differently is going to cause problems with the court regardless of whether they decide to accept it or they decide not to accept it. And, and you're going to have this huge training issue. But for us, and it's all pro. <laughs> I'm just telling you. This. Well, no, because I mean, I wouldn't mind it if you could issue an electronic certificate and then and then retroactively, like we we did, was mail them a certificate. Because from the student standpoint, they have a choice. They can either get fined two hundred dollars or they can pay extra to have an electronic certificate. And from their point of view, they would rather pay us extra to get an electronic certificate than they go walk in the court right now and avoid that two hundred dollars, even if they have to go do a show cause. So, you know, from, from a student standpoint, and that's really what we're aiming to do is make them happy. The more quicker whatever that we can do, that's all pro, regardless of the fraud implication. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, David. Hi, uh, David Bruce. Uh, look, I agree there will be some training issues, some questions from the, from the courts. They're a very important part of this. And I agree, trying to make the students happy is very important, uh, but sending them to court to relieve a ticket and have it not work out is just not beneficial to anyone. And I do think, um, yes, you can go order security paper off of Amazon. And we've always agreed, and Brian and I have had some conversation in front of the hearing, um, and one of the, the senators in that hearing was a judge, and she was fairly vocal about, yes, help the court system, and I'm paraphrasing Brian, but help, help us recognize what's real and take some safeguards in your industry to make it so it's more difficult to commit fraud. No one in, no, I'll speak for myself, there is no way to stop fraud, but I think making it more difficult and then being able to educate the court system, here's what we've done to make your job easier. Here's what we've done to make it more difficult for the student to commit fraud. You're never going to stop everyone. If they want to start a s kind of a sub-industry, hopefully we'll catch them. But trying to get a 16-year-old kid who's smarter than all of us probably on, on, on IT stuff to, to upload it to, to PDF and change a few things, that's what we need to take and that's what we need to stop. So if we can come up as a group and, and help that, I think the education will go much better with the court system because, again, if they lose faith in us and everyone loses faith in this industry, then they stop asking people to take driver safety. 
they start issuing more tickets, they start make, making them pay fines, but yet they don't have safer drivers on the road. And, and that's what we're aiming for. So we'll never be perfect. I'm not here sitting that we're going to be perfect, but I do think it's important we take the, the necessary steps to, to push in that direction. Definitely. Thank you. Nina Sane, and I'll second the part about losing faith because we are down to 600,000 students a year taking driving safety from over a million a year taking driving safety. And one of the issues is courts doing alternative sentencing and not sending them to driving safety classes. So that losing faith is a big issue in our industry. Any other comments? So David, it looks like that's a segue to uh, the pros about having the electronic. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to address some of the pros. Um, we have an online course, and you're right. Most, so many students wait to the last minute, whether they knew, whether they didn't know. Life gets busy. So if we can find a, a positive way to get them the certificate faster, it's absolutely a pro, there's no question. Um, but again, I will just restate, getting them the certificate faster somehow, but it not working with the court, it doesn't really help them. It gets them all excited, then they get really mad, then the court gets really mad, and then we all hear about it. So I do think it's about speed, and someone else mentioned up here uh, some time ago that you know, a lot of things are transmitted <coughs> electronically. You can close a house, you can do a lot of big purchases electronically, you can do your concert tickets. So it's certainly doable. Uh, and I think we just, this is a great form to work out how we get it done. Exactly. Yeah, recently when we refinanced, uh, we did everything through DocuSign. We signed, literally, I signed my name on my phone and sent it back that way. And so I do agree that this is, this is very important, this part of it. We know, and of course we still want to hear, hear pros and everybody's thoughts. We know the largest one is, is the student getting what they need in a quicker fashion. Uh, there is one of our driving <coughs> safety courses that, we're, uh, that we know for sure has identified all of the counties that accept electronic certificates. So there is one of those. I mean, that the, the information is out there, the technology is out there, how do we get to that. And they actually do electronic transmission. They don't email a certificate, they actually transmit to the court themselves that the student has completed driver driving safety with a certificate number and then they mail the, the actual um, physical certificate to the student. Carlos Reyna, um, I'm more and more leaning towards finally fulfilling that requirement statute that the agency be involved. And I think that would, for the courts, reduce their worries about fraud because so. it's coming from one central place. And I think also if the agency is involved, there won't be the special benefit to one course provider over another course provider and select this, select that. For courts that do not have electronic, they need to get with the program, okay, because I mean, that's where we are today, and so that's working with the judicial uh, people to see how can we get them up to speed so everybody can do it that way. And so I think that would be a con if we head that direction. Yes, sir. Mr. Abosset, I think one of the most challenging jobs for you guys, you have to go in parallel to electronic certificates as to how to educate the courts or the judges how to accept the electronic certificates and what are the pros and the cons as Mr. Bruce mentioned that before. Getting them to accept the electronic certificate understanding what you guys are coming from, that will give them a lot of response and cooperation with you guys. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's exactly the purpose of why we're here because it, it, that's exactly right. We need to, it, at the end of the day, it's going to be a communication uh, issue on how we, how we talk about it, how, Carl, as you're saying, communicate that to all the, to the judges, to all of the different counties. So really, all of the pros that we, that we would talk about, just the opposite of that would be the con. So we got to be mindful of that, no matter however we pitch this and however we, what ideas we come up with, 
uh, and David mentioned this, and I think Nina said the same thing, you know, we need to be expeditious. It needs to be a faster avenue, but on the flip side, it could hurt us, all of us, because if it doesn't work and they paid this money, then it's like, well, wait a minute. I did this, and you facilitated this for, for, for the electronic to happen quickly, but yet it wasn't beneficial to me. So, you know, all of these pros of getting it quicker, the flip side of it could be a con, so we just need to be mindful on the implementation and what avenues we take to make that happen. So let's hear some more on to, so that we can get some, uh, some good ideas on how we need to, to get this going. And I, and I would tell you at the end of the day, we're, we're, we're going to take all of these, all these comments and we're going to get together and we're going to have some more discussion on how we're going to implement uh, your suggestions and comments to make sure that we get it right. Pros. Pros, actually, you know, I, I'm going to blend them now because it's really, like I said, pros is going to, the flip side is just going to be the con. So yeah. uh, tell me some of the things, other things that you may come up with that you might, might work, Blake. Uh, Blake Garrett, uh, some just pros also that I don't think anyone here minds the cons of. It can be cheaper for the consumer, and then it can also be less expensive for our businesses. Uh, the cons, USPS and FedEx will make less money. So I think we're all okay with those cons, but there are potential cost savings for both the consumer and our businesses. And as far as the financial aspect, we just we do want to point out you are in charge of your own financials as a business. We will the only thing that's in statute is that you cannot charge less for the course. The rest of it, that's you. So just FYI, TDLR will not weigh in on that because you are private businesses. Chirak Patel. Uh, we have had issues where we ship certificates through USPS and they've gotten lost. Someone has paid us 25 bucks to take the course and it has gotten lost several times. It really hurts us business when that happens and going through electronic and sooner we can go through that, it really helps us and as well as consumers as well. Just wanted to add that into your comment there. Thank you. <coughs> We're thinning out cons. here. What's I going know, on? I know. Everybody's hungry, I think. Security delivery of the electronic certificate. I think we sort of We've touching on about, that. Yeah. Uh, does anybody have any additional thoughts on the security of delivery? I mean, Bill, you made an interesting point because, I mean, we're doing it now. I mean, it's a good point. Why not just scan it and send it in. I mean, that's, that's, a, good, that's a good comment. Uh, what would be the difference uh, in the electronic? Do we have to create something different? I mean, I, we, uh, the department, in the, the time I've been here, if we don't have to reinvent the wheel, let's not reinvent it. We're, we're all aboard on that. We want to use ideas and things that are already established and what people know already, because try to, try to teach somebody something different is going to be difficult. And if we could utilize some established methodologies that will get to our goal, will be useful. So I mean, some of the things you said, that's, that's really good stuff. I, I've been in situations, David, I, where I've, I've ordered something online. And I think, Mr. Patel, you, you mentioned this, that if they send it to you and it explicitly tells you you have a certain amount of hours to print this out, and after that, you cannot access it any longer. And so they print out a copy. And if we think further than that, if they mail you a copy, they're going to have it for how long at that point? They will always have it. And so those are, you know, just some, some things to think of. I've, like I said, I've received those links, and you have, you have three hours or 24 hours to print this out. After that, this link will no longer, it's like Mission Impossible. It'll explode, or Tom Cruise will come down from the ceiling. We're not sure. But <laughs> it'll get to the point to where you only have a certain amount of time to actually print that certificate, and if you don't, and if you don't do it, then, or if you do, you go back a day later and it's not available. So just, just an idea to throw and, in there. And with that said, do we need to have, you know, same, circuit, same certificate, everybody using the same thing? What do you guys think about that? I mean, just like the concert ticket. I'm going to go in, I'm going to buy David, my ticket, David and mine looks the same the just like yours. And once so it's scanned and the, in the, in, in the checks and balances are done, I can't hand it off to a friend of mine for him to come in, they're going to say, whoa, wait a minute. That is an actual uh, 
concert ticket, but it's been used. Sorry. Well, I, sorry, it's been used. So is that a possibility? I mean, should we, should we do that? Should the department create its own and everyone uses it? What do you guys think about that? David, um, one second, David and then Cindy. Uh, David Bruce. <clears throat> so a couple of things, uh, Carrie, that you've said. One thing about the paper copy, um, and I know we're moving to electronics, but the great thing about the paper copy is the course provider controls what it says, controls what it looks like, controls what paper it's on, and they do mail it to the, the student. Uh, there's security paper that we use, I'm sure many of you use it, so if you make a copy it says void, if you try to erase it it says void. Again, you can go buy the security paper, but I think it does take a big step to prevent the, the I call them a child, but, uh, you know, the 16 or whatever year old kid from just going in there not going to tell mom and dad again about getting another ticket and just make this happen twice. So you don't have that with the electronic version, and so having a consistent look and feel I think is a big, big help. Uh, again, we keep bringing up concert tickets. Um, I'm willing to probably bet that a, a young person is going to make sure they print out a legible ticket to go to their favorite concert. They're not going to take the risk of printing it on a, on a broken printer or something. The, the, the barcode is not quite right. They're probably going to spend some time to print it out. I can't promise that when they're trying to deal with the court system, but they're not going to miss their favorite concert because their ticket doesn't work. But having a, un a standard look across the industry, which is easy, I mean, we're not looking for anything complicated, but the, the, I think that would add a lot of credibility and also cut down the training process, perhaps with the court system. Here's what it's going to look like. This is it. Um, we can't control the paper that the student will print it out on. That's something we're just going to have to get over. We can't control it. But you can control the size of it so they don't show up as something on the size of a note card. Um, and again, if there's something a little awkward about it, the court can always call us. But at least you give the court something they can have in their office to look at and say, yep, this is what the TDLR said it looks like. This is what it looked like. It's been in the kid's backpack, but it's pretty darn close. I think that's a big deal. The other thing you mentioned, there's plenty of software programs, and you can actually design them yourself so they're, 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 not, they're not expensive. To your point, uh, here's the link. You, have, you can download it once, you can print it once, and then it goes away. Um, so there's a lot of really economical and easy things we can all do as a industry to give some confidence to the court system that we're taking this seriously. I've seen some things, I can't remember what it was, but I've seen some of the security on printing a document that that will tell you before printing, please note this must be printed in color. And I'm wondering, that's some way of saying you just can't print this in black and white because there's certain colors that need to be seen. So I think there's something like that as well. There is. Because it's hard to, to, to uh, have you seen Brian's signature? I, I can't duplicate that. <laughs> and, <it's laughs> and if we get that in color or some fancy color, uh, that, that, that's, that's the fraud prevention right there. Uh, very true. <laughs> uh, anything else, guys, um, on that, Cindy? Yeah, I have two thoughts, Cindy Newland. Uh, um, while I'm sitting listening to this, one, the the fact that if we can show a DPS trooper our insurance certificate on our phone, why do we have to print it? There's n multiple people walking around that don't have any capabilities of printing, let alone color. Yeah. So I'm going to show it to you on my phone. I can show you my Southwest Airlines ticket on my phone. So, but it all comes from one grand database and it's all created and it started with the grand database programming that was the Hilton company which is much like what you're talking about with buying um, concert tickets but buying reservations in a right. at a kiosk somewhere in another hotel or you know whoever seeing keying the information in and it goes back to one bay main database and just like the, the SBIC, you can, everybody knows a teacher certificate, teacher educator certificate prints out on executive size paper, otherwise it's too big, and it always pastes all the same information in the same place. Or if you want the pretty version, you can go print it, the educator certificate, like you just graduated. But those are the only two things 
and it always looks the same. And then at time and date stamps, the bottom came from this, this website or this database on this date and this time, updated, period. So why are we even worrying about what the certificate looks like and what, who's going to print it on what paper when 10 years from now we're not any of us going to be walking around with paper? But wouldn't you want a, a uniform look, even if it's not yes, printed? Yes, I wanted, okay. I wanted a, a uniform look and a uniform view, much like view, the, sure. the two different, if you're going to print it, the short sure. copy, the teaching certificate, or here's my fancy. Because everybody has a smartphone. Right. I mean, I agree. I mean, I. I <coughs> no, excuse me, not everybody. <laughs> Everybody has a smartphone. Uh, yeah, and everybody <laughs> doesn't have a smartphone, also doesn't have a color printer. <laughs> <laughs> or they can't access it here. So here's something that it was going through my head when I was listening to that. I had somebody from Vietnam come to try to TPSD road test and couldn't print their certificate from the Impact Texas Young Drivers because it was in an email that they couldn't re-access from the Google e email because they had now a different U.S. phone rather than the um, country code correct phone that was on it, so they couldn't even get there. So how do I seal that in an envelope to go to the DPS? Uh, Bill Blasson game. Let's be brief. I forgot half what I was going to say anyway, so we're <laughs> all this thing. Got it all. Uh, the standard look, I, I really like the idea. We're going to volunteer our certificate. Everybody can have access to it. We're going to let y'all use our, our certificate. So we're okay with that. Is that a pitch? I kind of <laughs> 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 we'll just let you look at it. <laughs> give it to you. It's a yeah. uh, A lot of us have been in business for a long time, and I don't mean to be critical, but I'm part of the public out there, too. And I think we're giving way too much intelligence to our public out there. I mean, be honest with you, how many people are going to spend the time to go through here and try to reproduce a certificate? I mean, really, what are we doing here? I mean, they want to get this thing to the court and get out of here. I mean, that's, that's basically it. So I agree with the standard part, and I agree with we need to have some checks and balances, which I think we already have, basically. The court can call us at any time. Our phone number's on there. We can verify this. I think really what we're doing here is that, kind of going back to my original PDF, <laughs> send them the certificate, let the chips fall where they may. If the court wants to accept it, which they have an option, they can accept it. If not, if there's a list, we can give the list out, which would be nice to have that list. I think we're really expecting all these people all of a sudden realize, oh my gosh, I can make my own certificate. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think people have this, the time. And I only think I can't even use my <laughs> cell phone. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, I've been like trying to business. I can't even use this thing. I mean, you know, it's, I can answer it. That's about it. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm just saying, I think we may be, we Overkill. may be out there where an area that we're not even going to be sure. there. Sure, that's fine. If that makes sense. Good. But but you agree on a on a similarity, have a uniform. Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll give you off that. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah, Robert Cardenas, I, I, and uh, I agree, but it just goes back to the confidence that the courts have in the in in, in the industry, and I think that's what David was saying about. We wanted just to make sure that the courts keep that confidence in the industry because, like Nana said, the numbers have gone down, and uh, you want to make sure they feel that they can still offer that that service and, and confidence. That's that's the, that's what I like that uniform certificate, and also when a person completes the online, do they actually get the PDF right there, or do we still have to electronically email them the certificate? <coughs> that uh, would that be a, that would be something that we would uh, put in the procedure as the industry feel do, would be. Do we know what we're leaning? I'm in the We don't have any ideas at this point. We are really, uh, we're focusing on what you as the industry would think would be best for, because we have driver education schools that do the electronic and they do an instant up, you know, PDF pops up, you print. We have some that will actually email on the back end because okay. they don't have that, that technology. So that would be a business decision. Okay. Unless we make it a standard procedure, which is, that's why we're... Yeah, or, use, or use Bill's certificate. Or use Bill's yeah. certificate. Carlos Reyna, um, the email certificate could work if it's password protected, okay? So only that person has access to it or be able to get online, 
password protected encrypted certificates the, all you can do is just really lessen the possibility of fraud but um, again I think having one standardized base one standardized certificate and one standardized base for the court to go to I still think it's it'd be the safest way to go for the court to ease the court's concern standard certificate okay uh, Brian Beal, uh, E and E. Uh, I've heard several times about the specifications, and that's one of the things that we look at when a course provider wants to develop or, or as a new course. We tell them you have to print your own certificate. These are the specifications for it. One of the things I do know about the specification: there's no color requirement, other than for certain words or certain control numbers, but the paper itself has no color code requirement, so other than to be pantograph uh, type, and that's it. So that's, uh, that's a good idea on that end of it. If we want to have uniformity, something to increase the integrity with the courts, but electronically, like you said, Ms. Newland, like you said, if, it, if I can show it on my device and it's all one specific and they have this printed version and the electronic version are exactly the same color and format layout, then we may have a problem solved. Uh, Eric Brown again. I know. Um, I, I think one of the I, I think this electronic thing could be give the courts more um, comfort if uh, with this if you're able to provide some kind of facility where they can look it up. But you could do some kind of QR code that's actually on the electronic, and that way, if if the courts are able to somehow, they could just instantly verify that this is a legitimate certificate by having that QR code point back to some centralized location that automatically logged them in without them having to actually diddle it. That, I don't know. Which I was I waiting for somebody to say that. A QR code? Yeah. QR code, I'm surprised. Which I can agree to that because you figure how many people go through the Houston court system? Yeah. How many people go through the Dallas court system? How many people go through the Austin court system? We're talking thousands of people. Will, they, the, will the court themselves decide, I have time or I don't have time? You know, you spoke about we give too much, lend too much credence to our public, and that's really, a, and if we look at the other side, that's the court has that same idea. And so <coughs> it, if we are able to create a database from the uploads that we get on a monthly basis and we figure that out, these are ideas that we can bring in, and that way really it's the court who is actually putting their faith in us and not the actual person. And so there's that, there's that check and balance that we will definitely be looking at. So it sounds like everyone agrees <coughs> with the second to the last bullet, not the last bullet, that we should have a standardized design. I, th I think that's the consensus here in the room. Right? Okay. Michael Strun. I just wanted to kind of quantify mm -hmm. what I'm hearing in the room and speak from like nine years of combating fraud and uh, counterfeiting and everything else. Um, Bill and Cindy both had great points. I mean, when she brought up the a trooper, you know, can verify your insurance on a phone. Um, I, I don't want people to focus too much on you know the differences between paper versus electronic because kind of where Bill was going with it which is the level of fraud or how much you need to combat it is solely based on the opportunity the ease and the gain for that for that individual um, you know as you said maybe there's not as much there uh, there are companies that spend millions, hundreds of thousands of dollars to create a paper document um, that still can be counterfeited. And you know, even your driver's license, you may know of two or three overt security features in it. There are 30 plus in it. And so, and that costs hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars more than maybe, you know, if you really like want to get to a point uh, to pr you know, prevent all fraud, the, it gets very expensive for all parties involved. And that's why you see leading into where Cindy was coming from, which is um, what all agencies, government, and other entities have gone to is that you have a central uh, location that is verifying that. So your issuing authority technically is the one that verifies that information. That's, that issuing authority is the course provider. That information could be housed at TDLR or with the course provider themselves. But at the end of the day, whether that is a paper certificate or is an electronic certificate, that is where the industry as a whole has gone to to, uh, to combat 
counter, uh, counterfeiting and, and, and fraudulent means of producing documents, and it's the only way. Now, how you get the courts involved on that when they're as busy as they are, um, you know, to use that information, uh, that's, a, that's another question as well. But again, just a comment and food for thought for everybody when, when you're going on it, because y'all are really hitting on all these topics, and that's really the backbone of where everything that you're coming from is there. No one's really wrong or off on this. These are all standard issues that every business faces. With us, it. Sam Webb. The standard design, it would seem, would need to include the penalty for forgery, since fraud is the big concern, and make it just like a hundred thousand dollars, a million, whatever, really bad fine. So if you f counterfeited it, <coughs> you're having to read on there, hey, I'm about to be stung badly by faking this, just as a deterrent. Which I can see that, and yeah, we're going to put that down because at this time there is no, there is. I mean, the court may, the court may, but as TDLR, of course, that would have to come through legislation, but that's definitely something that we can put on the, on the list of, of items to talk about. Well, I would just like to... He was looking for ver verbiage, right? Yeah, ver on the, is, the question is of the certificate design. The design should state the penalty for forgery, and how that is if it's a regulatory, if it's a TDLR or a you know a court penalty, just to make sure that when you're faking it and you're 16 and you're so smart, you have to read. <laughs> oh, I've got to put this language in here about how badly I can lose if I do this. Because uh, speaking to driver education, on the certificate of completion, there is a. a, a uh, something on that says you may commit a crime if you submit this to the Department of Public Safety, n it being untrue. We'd have to check with the court. I'm sure there is something in the court somewhere that says if you give the court a fraudulent document, they'll, you know, slap you with a fine. And um, we, we, we speak to that portion of it on our certificate in, in reference to DPS. With this, it would be, it would actually speak in reference to the court system and DPS because it goes to court first and DPS. And so that's, that's a great idea. Yes, sir. I we could mush would, that all together. We can mush it, back. and it'll have a really great flavor. <laughs> right, Ron? I don't know if I want to follow that, but um, <laughs> yes. I just want to second that. I think it's great, uh, David Brees, by the way, I think it's great to inform the person who's about to do this. Like, do I really want to do this? Some of them might do it, mm -hmm. but at least they're informed, and that might make them pause. Uh, so I just want to say I think that's a great idea. Because like I said on the back end, it, it could potentially be caught at DPS when this information is put on the driving history. Uh, it, it, and it, it doesn't happen that often. Um, and I know this because my husband works in conviction reporting. He works for DPS and he enters all the certificates that you guys give and it goes to DPS. That's his job. He enters it onto the driving history. And so it doesn't happen a lot. But I do agree, we need to, let's prevent it as much as possible. I think we're all in agreement on that one. Any more concerns? You guys are awesome. All right. That says 10 minute break. All right, we're gonna go through this real quick because I'm sure everybody's about to eat each other's arms in here. <laughs> and so um, I think this won't take very long. How many online driving safety providers do I have? here right now. Put your hand down, Brian Francis. Okay. Driving safety providers. We created the, 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 the search tool. Driving safety traditional. We have that. We've, th there are two different designs that I want to show you guys. And to, to go back just real quick to what Ray said, we have to remember that the customers come to our websites. And how many IT people do I have in the room that are very IT savvy? What is you, usually, Eric. I know Eric, I know you. What is usually some of the biggest things that you hear from customers, which is, I just want to get to it. The less clicks, the better. And so there's a couple of different options that we want to go with um, that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll listen to input and then we'll go from there. So as you know right now, and we have already talked about that. This is what it looks like right now if you're going to take uh, defensive driving online, driving safety, however you want to say it. We list each school that offers an online driving safety course, 
and we list the city, state, county, and zip code of where the school is located. Not the online course is located, but the school is located. Um, sometimes I'm, I'm sorry, actually, I take that back. It's isn't it where the it's where the course provider is actually located because some of them are actually in California. School. Okay. And that's why we didn't do it the other way. Yes. So this is the current view, if you've been to our, our website anytime, any, you know, anytime soon. So proposal one would be, as normal as this currently happens, the customer would select the online, that they want to take an online defensive driving course, driving safety course. It would do a drop down, and they would, they would select standard driving safety. Uh, we've looked at, of course, updating that wording because a lot of t people don't have a clue what standard means, but it does indicate, that, okay, no, I don't need to take specialized, uh, I don't want to take Spanish, or I do want to take Spanish, and then it helps from there. So the first proposal would be, one, we would remove the city, state, county, zip. They're taking it online. Do they really need to know all that information? We would list the course providers who have, an on, who have been approved to have an online course, and those, those providers would be listed. The customer would select the course provider of their choice, and it would be routed to a page with a list of the schools that offer that online course. There's a couple of, us, of other states that currently have this process. And we think in terms of clicks. So we're at one, two, three. We're at three or four at this point, not, not starting from the actual driving safety part, I mean the TDLR website. Step three, the customer would then select the driving safety school of their choice and would be routed to the school's website. So you would go to, you would have the, the list of course providers. So we have about 40 unique, by the way, we have about 40 or so unique actual course providers that have a CP license. It would be that list. Then you would click on this list or you would click on the course provider of your choice. It would bring you now to this list, which would list all of the driving safety schools that currently offer that course online. And then the customer themselves would click on what school they decide that they want to use, and now they'd be going to the driving safety schools page that is actually that driving safety schools page, and at that point would select driving safety. So I will say, um, it, it, it lists all the schools. If we look at the pros and cons, actually that's towards the end. Um, <clears throat> and so I'll stop on, I won't talk about pros and cons yet. Let me show you the next proposal. And then at the end we'll talk about the pros and cons. So are we all clear on how design one would work? Yes, ma'am. Sure. Thank you, Mara Cardenas. So you're discussing, you know, we want to make it as easy as possible for the customer. So you're saying the customer, the student that wants to go take the course. So most of, I, I think most of them aren't aware of maybe the course provider name. They're thinking the school. So, so this instead of, you can also bypass that, right? And they just put in the, the school name and it'll pop up as well. Instead oh yeah, of going that's, to course that's already in the, name. yeah, um, okay. if I'm not mistaken. But what, okay. we're talking online mm -hmm. because if they want to take an online course, are they really familiar with the school that offers that online course? Well, the name that they get on, on the... Yeah, they're, so they're the traditional, yes, because you have, you know, you're driving down the street and you see ABC, you know, whatever driving, defensive driving. So, like, okay, yeah, I need to go take a course. Traditionally, you are exactly correct. Mm -hmm. From the feedback that we've received from the public, they could care less what school offers it. They're looking for the online portion so they can click on it and take it. That's all they want to do. But I, I see your point, though. I see your point. And then you do have some people that know of a school because their friend said, hey, I took my driving safety at this particular school. And so there's, there's a lot of different ways. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Um, wait, 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 wait. wait. Oh. Okay. <coughs> Hi, Shanesty. I have a question to the course providers or the driving safety schools that are offering the online. Um, when you guys send out your advertisements to students or individuals who have cases, don't, don't you guys do this? How do you advertise? Do you send postcards in the mail to these people? 
what are you putting on, on that advertisement for your online courses? Are you listing just the course name or are you listing the school name? Just the website name. The website and the school name for online. The links are all hidden. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so if we we're gonna go to and again these are some things that we've thought of. The next one would be design proposal number two. As normal, this is the, f the first step. We know they would select online and standard driving safety. Step two, all approved online driving safety courses would be listed by the name of the online course for the customer to make the selection. <coughs> so I go to this page, and now we'll list all of the 40 unique online courses that I have the uh, opportunity to take my course from, and that's it it takes you directly to their page and you select driving safety. Now, on those pages, per rule, and everyone needs to remember this, by rule, if I click on comedyguys.com, they are required to show the name of that course, the name, I'm sorry, the name of the course provider, the course provider's license number, the name of the school, and the school's license number, per rule, every single one. All 40 need to have that. So FYI, if you don't, I would suggest looking at your stuff. What, 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 why are you bringing that up? Are people not doing that? People are not doing that. This is FYI. About they're, 70%. They're 70% of the folks are not doing that. So just FYI. A, just a FYI. This is something that, that has been in rule. This is nothing new. And those of you that have dealt with TDLR now for a couple of years, you should know we go by rule and law. Can and you repeat what you just said? That at TDLR we go by rule and no, law? No, no, oh, no. okay. <laughs> I was excited, yes, yes. The, 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 what they have to do. On your website, if you have an ADM, with, which is what it's commonly known, you offer an online driving safety program that hasn't been approved. By rule, you are required to list the course provider name and number and the school that offers the course and their number on any one of these pages. What are we seeing now? What are the common mistakes? Nothing. You'll have the course provider on there sometimes. The school, I don't, over, over, I'd say at least 80% don't actually have the school listed. It's supposed to be listed also in two different places, the very first page and the enrollment page. And that's so the customer knows who they're actually dealing with. It's, it's, it too often happens because we have people calling us all the time, is this a real school because I clicked on the name and then it brought me to a totally different website and I don't know if this is real. I, am I allowed to take this? And then we have to actually go through the entire process saying, yes, it's, it's approved. It's actually this. This is the rule that, you, that, that course providers are required to follow. And again, we're not following it. And so we, um, we want to make sure that everybody is fully aware of this. Terry, this is Carlos Schwena. On either one of those two um, designs, is is this going to prevent a course provider from submitting the same course over and over and over, getting different names and listings to be on that list? Okay, so we need to understand how driving safety works versus driver's education, parent taught, whatnot. If you are a course provider, you have a school, anytime you submit an ADM, it's $9,000. That's the current fee. That's the fee structure. The course provider lies, so you, it, it, it goes in a different route those that are not familiar. You have to first submit your traditional course. That course is also a $9,000 fee and it must be approved. Once that traditional is approved, you now are applying for your course provider license. Your course provider license is $2,000. Once you get that course provider license and you want to put your traditional online, it's now also an additional $9,000. So we're talking 20 at tops. Now, if you are a course provider and you think your course is just the, the bee's knees, that's great. You can submit it as a traditional, 9,000. Then you have to get a course provider license, another two. Then you have to go through the other process. It's still the same process. Now, I will tell you, when we took over this program, it was, it was kind of crazy. So there are some things that we, are, that we are looking at at this time to make sure that everybody has met those requirements and if you have not met those requirements we'll contact you and make sure that we meet those requirements because we want to make sure that the process is fair for everybody and we will take we'll take it if we didn't do it correct the first time 
We'll make sure it is correct going forward. That's something that we have done throughout this entire industry, whether you're driver education, driving safety. That's what we're working towards. There's still a lot of work to do, but that's what we're here for. We want to make sure it's done. Consistency. So if we look at design one, the pros and cons. Now, on these, this is what my team could think of. There may be additional pros and cons. We don't know. That's why we're showing you guys. One second. That's why we're showing you guys, because we want your input on this. So the pros. Each school offering an ADM will be listed. The list will have a clean, streamlined look. And prior to visiting the school's website, the public will know what school offers it. So if they want to have a particular school that they want to go to, not just the online, that would be the pro. The con would be that there will be multiple steps before the customer even lands on the actual course website. Now, the CP list will rotate. The school list will not. It'll be a stagnant list. I mean, we're looking at our T guys. We're trying to make sure this is done. But the CP will be done, uh, yes, just like we have everything else. That, that page that they are routed to to find out that information, it's going to be a standalone stagnant list. Too many pages, options could become confusing for the customer. This is what we hear, guys. We hear people call us and say, I just want to take the course. I've, I've clicked 8,000 times. It's like the black hole of a website. I don't know where I'm going. AT&T. AT&T. I only chat AT&T. I don't even call them anymore. I will tell you, if this is what is decided by the department to go with, this timeline for the revisions are longer than design two. Because each course provider, again, 40-ish, We'll have to create a separate page for each one of those schools. And that has to be incorporated into the design tool. So it is, it is a little bit a longer of a process. But again, it does have each school offering it. Uh, it it'll have, again, this clean, streamlined look. Um, we did, there, again, there's a couple other states that do it like this. And so we've looked at that option to begin with. Are there any questions or comments on one? Um. One of the points you have mentioned here is school list will not rotate. Doesn't that mean if some school ends up on one particular list with, let's say, alphabetical, the people who have letter A, for example, will get higher click-through rate and will probably end up Most likely, yes. with more users? Mm -hmm. Coming from programming side, it is actually very easy for you to make that list rotate, which will kind of give everyone a fair chance. Mm -hmm. Is that not something you guys have thought of? We'll, we'll, we'll put that down Yes. Uh, as one of the uh, cons, or actually pro. I guess if you want it, it will be a pro, a con if it's not Depending happening. Depending on your A or Z, it will so, be a con or pro. So <laughs> yeah, good point. Uh, Thank you so for that. Forward, yeah, we'll put that down. Anyone else? I'm confused. Yeah. Confused. <laughs> on. You're saying design one and list is not randomized? No, design one. The I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> The course provider list would be randomized. When you select, oh, okay. yes, when you select that course provider, it'll then transmit to their school page. Okay, then I have Eric Brown. So I have a different question then. In the CP, in, the, in design one, where you're just listing the 40, it's only the CP and not the CPs that have paid the additional nine for the other ADMs. Or are the additional ADMs listed as part of the part of that. Does that make sense? Do you understand yeah, so the nuance here? Yeah, okay. Yeah, we have that written down. Thank you. Um, anybody else? Any more? Oh, breaking the mic here. Any other comments on design one? Pros, cons? Trey, could you explain what Eric was talking about? I, I, didn't, under, I didn't understand That's, the nuance of his nuance. Yeah, there's just something totally <laughs> different. Yeah. <laughs> so it's completely different. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Chirag Patel. One of the questions we get asked a lot is that, are you approved school, right? Um, with other states, there is actually a page that every provider is given where it clearly states, is the, what is the license status, for example, if it's current or expired? Uh, when was the license renewed? What is that expiration date? If somehow TDLR is able to make a page for us that we can tell students that here's our unique page, click on this, you can see what our license status is. I think it will reduce down a lot of calls that we get at this point. Um. Thank you. You got that? OK. Anybody else? Yes. Yes, Shanesty. With education and exam. Just one moment, please. <laughs> Mm 
So you're saying, Patel, you're saying that yeah. Yeah. you want them to be able, is, and I think what we're talking about here is just click on the actual course provider, and that will be the unique page of the course provider. That's actually some verbiage, and this is what Shan brought up. The way that we have our website set up, and this is, this is actually, we should probably put a note on the website, even if it changes or doesn't. The only people that will be listed are the ones who have an active license with the department. Because if you are within a, even a certain amount of days of expiring, then you're not on the website. That's how we have the page set up now. But that's not widely known. So that's actually a great point to actually put it on the website. If they are listed here, then they are approved. And so, uh, and, and some verbiage, we can talk to IT on that one, but that's, that's a great point. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. So if we look at design two, the pros and cons, again, this is what we want to hear you back because we could only really think of one for the cons. But uh, the, the list will, ha again, have a clean, streamlined look. The public will have quick access to the course, less clicks. The course provider list will rotate, giving a fair listing for all course providers. And the timeline for the site revisions are shorter than design one. It stays in-house. It doesn't take our IT long to get this fixed whenever we make the final decision. The cons, of course, the public will not be aware of what school offers the course until they visit their website. Because as I stated before, it is a requirement that it be listed on the website what school offers it and what the course providers, uh, the, the name of both the school and the CP and the number of the license number of each. So it's similar, I think, of kind of what you were talking about here because you're going to go to the course provider and you're going to go, oh, this guy is licensed. And now I'm going to go there and now I'm going to see everything else of all the schools. Well, you know, since he's licensed, these are the people offering a course. So that, I think that sort of addresses what you're talking about, whether it's legit or not, instead of going to all of the schools and then not knowing who's tied to what. <coughs> Eric Brown. Um, I think Mr. Patel here said that um, I think what he's talking to about is California, roughly. California has an intermediate pay. They have a thousand people on the list. The, 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 where they drop the ball is exactly where he's talking about, though. You see a list of names. That's really all it is, names and telephone numbers. And when you click on the name, it goes to a, a verification page, basically, that says the license status of that provider. And it's either valid or invalid or whatever, based on something. I don't, I don't know why it would be on the list if it's invalid, but whatever. Um, what they don't do, though, is on that intermediate page where you're checking to see if it's a valid school, they don't have any way to get to the school. They don't have a link to go out to the, I, I can't tell you how many calls you get going, well, I'm here, I'm on the DMV site, but I can't get to the school. So. If you're wanting to address that issue, you could put up some kind of intermediate that says, yeah, they're valid, and here's a link to the site. If you do it the way California does it, it's a mess. But well, that's, that's why I think if we add that, um, add that big, bold document or big, bold letters or somewhere that says, if they're on this list, they are approved and their license status is good, period. But you don't see, I guess for the two of you, Eric and Mr. Patel, you don't, do you see that problem here? I just want to make, okay. I just want to make sure. Okay. Okay. The only problem on your side is that you physically take them away from your side. Your link is not a blank. It needs to be a blank. Meaning, where the action? Your HRS takes them to the site, and they're no longer on the TLR site. I think. I'm pretty sure that's the way it works. So if you go to TLR.gov, Sorry, I'm just listening. If I think if I, I don't I don't go to the TDLR website a lot, but if you go sure. to the, if you go That's to the not what Bill says. Uh, I've, I've done my <laughs> I've done my fair amount of investigation, but if I recall correctly, when you go to the list and you click on the school name, it takes you physically to the school, and you are no longer on the TDLR website, right. which is fine, but a better way to do that would be to ha change your AHREF your anchor tag to go to an underscore blank and that way it takes you to a brand new page or tab set within your browser and then you're still on the TDLR website. So it gives the customer an ability to go to multiple courses from the same page. With that. But once they've gone off to our site, they are no longer on your site and they, in order to get back to your site, they have to physically either backtrack 
start over again, whatever. Or, you know, and a lot of users just aren't that savvy, but if you, if you open the link in a new window, then it gives them the opportunity to visit multiple pages within the same search facility, if that makes sense. That's right. right. Yeah. <laughs> your anchor tag is, it, it takes them away from your side. It's, 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 yeah, well, any, any client I have, I would always recommend that they, they never leave their site. So if they're going to do a link out, I would recommend they, they link to a new page as opposed to the way you're doing it right now. I think that's the way you're doing it. Brian, this is Carlos. Could you interpret that for me? <laughs> <laughs> click, and then don't, you don't have to do a back click. You're still in there. <laughs> that is the goal. We'll, we'll uh, play this back for our IT guy. And, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> so yes, David. They understand each other. Any uh, thoughts, questions? David. Um, David. So, sorry, uh, David Bruce. Uh, look, thanks for all the effort for options one and two. I think, you know, it's like beauty. Everybody's got their own opinion of it. But I think design two, to your point, the less clicks, the better. Um, I think that's a good point about maybe not taking them off the TLR page, but I think the less clicks, the better. And I don't really experience the issue, or are you a real course or not? I mean, I don't get a lot of questions like that, but assuming other people do, perhaps, again, the language up there, but maybe just the thought of putting this has been updated as of and just have it auto-populate mm -hmm. today's date. So, I mean, y'all are on top point. of it, but a lot of other uh, websites aren't on top of it, so give the, the reader, okay, look, it's, it's October the 4th, said this, everyone's approved, perfect, they're going to move Oh, forward. I still see language that says approved by TEA. Agreed, and, and I think you hit the nail on the head. It's all about uh, the, the feel good, the credibility. Am I, is this spam? Am I going somewhere that I shouldn't be going? And that's the kind of calls we get. Yeah. So yes, agreed, the, the less clicks we can do, the more uh, certainty that that user is going to where they want to go, that's what we want. And, and that will reduce our phone calls, and, and we won't have to try like to start idea. you know, making changes back and forth. Just to clarify, uh, if you want to, on our website, on TLR's website, you want to see when they were last updated, so that when they go to that school, they know that when the last time we verified that license. Well, so it, on that school's webpage, you want yeah, to Correct. So, so uh, not on the, on the schools, search, but on the TLR, TLR's website. If it, if it is an issue, if you just put and auto-populate of that current date. This, this license was effective as of, and then today's date, today's date, today's date. Something to that, which is almost like the language, but either way, I think would be great. Yeah, that's a great idea. Anybody else? Sandy. Can I just speak to the population where we are producing this for? I'm sorry? The course providers are putting this all on the internet, and the people, I offer it, if you want to take it home and put it, pop it in your TV, you can take this DVD. Or if you can't do that and you'd rather have me individually educate you, then you can come sit in my classroom. Mm -hmm. Or you can go to my course affiliate, Aceable, and you can do that. Mm -hmm. I teach junior high and high school kids all day long, okay. and they do not read. So yeah. the least amount of clicks that you put on there is the much more effective for everybody involved. That's what we've been told. But then we're talking about the people that are going to be taking these defensive driving classes are all tech savvy now. They uh, Everywhere in your world you have to do that. You can hand a two-year-old a smartphone and they can figure out how to swipe and are they taking what? driving safety no but, <laughs> but i was worried trying, my point is we're trying to fix something that these are are these dinosaurs are almost dead already hey i'm not i'm not following you can get on the computer mister but so that we're trying to fix and, and go toward how can we make sure and link this and how can we make sure and and these kids are not the kids that are having to take defensive driving driver's ed over and over and over and driver safety sorry um, they are not worrying with the validity of it or that they're used to clicking a button and going there so 
that's who's going to be doing that, and you just need to eventually. randomize it. Eventually, because you know right now, it, the, 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 I will tell you, uh, from our side of it, which is we get so many phone calls, so many, I can't find anything. Why are there so many clicks? Why you do know, I have to do? Any idea if it's the same? I know this is one of the things that, that your team does. Do you have any idea the age of that person and how many times that person's calling in asking? I don't. Yeah, we don't. Unfor we don't because capture that. Because I think that. that so many of is has got to be a very large, ambiguous number. Being that I teach in a pretty small town, teach technology, those kids are all walking around and look faster than anything else. And those are the those are the. 16, 17, 18, 19. Which is understandable. But if, if with, we with the 700,000 licensees that we regulate in every industry, I, I have the same thought. In every industry, there is problems with technology and people not being Always, able sure. to use. And I'm thinking, you have a phone. What do you mean you don't know how to do But it happens. That's going to start going away, y'all. I Well, okay. Which, which is eventually. Well, but, and, 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 but, but, but so I'm what, saying let's look three years, five years, ten years down the road instead of trying to fix what five years ago didn't work. Well, no, but, it's, it, we're, what we're trying to do is, an, uh, is address a current issue. This is a current issue that we have. Uh, even five, ten years from now, it's still going to be an issue of, because if you, if you look at the 16, 17-year-old, they also don't want to go through eight clicks to get to that website, even though they right. know how, but they don't want Absolutely. to. Instant gratification. If we look at the, the generation that, that you, the dinosaurs, as you so lovely put it, they also don't want to go through eight, nine, ten clicks because at that point we're just confused. And now that's most of the phone calls that we get. I don't know, where am I going on here? And the, the, the instant gratification for both sides, whether it be for the teenager or for it be for, you know, like my mom right now, if she were to go to our website, um, she would, f she there, would there's no it. way there's no way she would that's not why I'm saying I think that 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 person is seven one person is seven to ten calls you're getting they keep because that's who picks up the phone and calls is that same generation and that's the that they'll, they'll and they'll walk back into the school and we'll do all that too so I, I'm wondering if we have this vast amount of people or if we have a vast amount of confusion and a little bit of people. Well, and we want and Cindy, to. I think this is Brian Francis. I think you make some really good points. We do need to look at what the issue is going to be down the road. I, I think the heart of the confusion here is that the world doesn't understand the difference between a provider and schools that can Absolutely. offer. Absolutely. That's, that's the whole problem. In all of our other programs, you have a school mm -hmm. and they're teaching it. Over here, you've got a provider and the other people can teach the providers courses and it's just that oddity that I think the people are trying to navigate through right and we're not going to change that part um, you know in this conversation but I think that contributes to it and I do agree that we've done some analysis in the past where we've been able to see that it was the same person calling back four times with the same question and sometimes even shopping for a question in this case sometimes they're just desperately trying to find you know where to click and how to get there uh, so I mean those are some great points of what is it going to look like down the road um, when we're dealing with that generation of, of folks that are going to be taking these courses. But I think it's really the provider school oh, dynamic that right, is the Right, right. And then that's a, if you're just listing the course providers, if you just list an ACEable, how does my affiliation with them ever get linked up yeah. there so I can get my mailbox money? <laughs> and I'll go back just to as delicately as possible, I'll go back to what Ray said. We structure our website for the customer, and that's what we're looking for. Um, we're not trying to take anything from anybody. We are trying to address a common issue that we have with our customers that call us and have this issue. And so, again, these are these are the these are what have been brought up. We will take all comments into consideration before making any final decision. Yes, ma'am. Mara Cardenas. Okay, so um, is there a way we could do it when a customer, they just want to search that school name? Are they approved? That's all I want to know. And That's I currently started available. Yeah. Okay, but if they, is there a way when they're typing in the name, can it be to where it doesn't have to match exact? I mean, cause some, can it be, they start typing in aceable and anything that comes starts out with ace maybe starts popping up and they can quickly find it and click what they want? That 
Yeah, we'll put that on the... Because a lot of times they're trying to put in the exact name, and I think maybe you guys are set up to match the exact name, and if they're off a little bit, it's not coming up. And then they're like, well... Or if they can spell it. Uh, yeah. I, you know, something that will start populating what they're typing in, and it'll pull up some schools with that name, and then they can be like, okay, this is what I'm looking That's for. We're getting calls. We get that, too. Um, I didn't find you guys, you know, and, and so I think that would... That makes sense. Like, I like Sloshy's sandwich. I can't spell it, so I gotta have to figure it out, and then it comes up. Get an easier name, I think. That's what they need to do. <laughs> Whatever. Good point. Very good point. I'd like to second that. Uh, Ricardo Benavides, Chair, uh, absolutely. If the name is not typed exactly, I have clients that are telling me it doesn't come out, and we're talking a letter here. Uh, so that would be great. That would be fantastic. I agree. Oh, yeah, Kenny's I'll listening. <laughs> All right, guys, anything else? And again, these are, these are the designs that we've, no, no. We're getting input. We are currently getting input. We have not made any decisions. We are getting input. Last clicks. Yes, sir, Bill. We like design too also, but we want to do a, want to ask a favor for, I guess, for all of us course providers, whatever y'all decide, because I know ultimately you will, uh, would you please let us know ahead of time <laughs> so we don't hit this thing on Friday afternoon where we can call you, you know, hey, what's going on here? Maybe even give us a chance to look at maybe a test site so we can maybe even put in some input and say, look, we like what you're doing, but really this is not practical because sometimes it's what happens is that it looks like a really good idea. It's pretty straightforward, but when we actually test it, we find out it's not really working the way you had intended or we had all agreed it should and should look like you don't want us to do it on friday at five o'clock <laughs> no. unless i get your cell phone number <laughs> yeah we'll definitely put it, those comments yeah. in but no we are not making any decisions at this time we are really just getting input that was the whole so, point of this is to gather input so bill you said design two it, it, you, that seems easier is that i think is that what seems easier design two design yeah design two design okay. two design one is that what yes. bruce two. design two, two as well okay I mean, do you guys see any, uh, any, well, since a lot of people talk about design too, is there any other, we couldn't think of anything, but is there any other downfall? You know, if, if this goes into place tomorrow, we're not going to do that. <laughs> but let's just say, it went, what, what hiccups are we going to have? Uh, do you see anything? Less. Less? Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> they'll ask this, this specific question. They'll say, I'm in Plano. Do I have to take a course from Plano? I get that question all the time. I'm surprised that you don't get questions about the, whether or not they're approved. The approved issue is not an issue of where they went to. Because I'll have, I said, well, what, are you on the TDLR website? Yes. So they clearly have something from the court that says you must take yeah, an approved the court. It's not, it's not you that's the problem. The court is saying that. They'll, they'll get paperwork from the court that says that it has to be a TEA course. And I'll have to explain to people, look, <laughs> I, we can't do that. I cannot tell you that we're TEA approved because we're not. You know, and, and I try to explain the issue. But it, that's an issue with paperwork from the court. But yeah. Yeah, we're aware of that one too. Which we're trying to work with that. We're trying to get everybody up to speed. Alrighty. Okay, so um, if are there any more questions about uh, their certificates? First thing, and then uh, on the search tool. And if you're not comfortable with this, you can always email us. Yes, sir. What does the timeline look like for the electronic certificate implementation? We're l l <laughs> let's put it this way. After this meeting, Ford has been gracious to be the scribe. We're going to take all of these comments, put them together. We usually group them, group all the comments. We'll have them. He has them tagged on who said what. We'll group everything together, look at all of the, the, the information, and we'll sit down and provide feedback to the exec office on our findings and what has, what has occurred. And then from that point, we talk about where do we go next. Uh, we don't have a time set in stone, just like with the, with the search tool. Uh, we're going to look at everything, make sure that we are doing the right thing. As you guys know, 
uh, and Bill, you, I, I know you, you know, said you wanted heads up, but as you know, we just don't try to run with something that quickly. We try to get some feedback. And of course, sometimes we don't hit the nail on the head right off the bat. And we stumble and fumble and do things. And we make changes. But right here now, we're like, OK, let's talk to the industry. What's going on? Let's see, wh what are we doing with the certificate? What are the pros and cons? Let's talk about the search tool. What do you guys think? So we brought some things to the table. And now we're going to go back and review them. And then we'll, sh we'll come back to you guys and share with you uh, on our findings and where we go next. Robert Cardenas, to be in compliance right now, uh, Austin Court, City of Austin, accepts electronic signatures. So can we, we would actually mail them and then we can email them a certificate that we have right now because that's, that's, that's where we're at right now yeah. because. Uh, I would like you to weigh on this one. So w the question was because we do have, w so we do have a particular school. They will, they send, they do a transmission to, to the, the courts, but this is a different situation. If, if the course provider is aware of a particular county that will accept an electronic certificate, if they send a PDF, but they also mail the certificate, by rule, uh, are, we, are we going there at this time? I didn't think we were. This is okay, I'm just want to make sure that we <laughs> hear this from GC. Yeah. yeah. I didn't believe that we were. Yeah, we not at this time. Yeah. The existing one isn't sending a PDF. They're transmitting actual name and certificate number to the court, but they're also emailing. So the, the court basically is going to be aware when the person brings in that physical that they're looking and saying, okay, yes, they match. That's what we were told. This has been in, we were made aware this has been in process. It's been, it's been in place prior to the transfer. We were made aware of it. Yeah. Carlos? Carlos, um, th then you've, you've taken input. You're all going to take it under advisement, under review, so forth, go over it with executive. Are we going to go into rule writing process, and will the work groups be part of that, or is this going to be something decided by just TDL and our staff? Mm -hmm. Yes, to all of the above except yeah. for the search tool. So for the certificate, yes. We'll, yes, get, we'll um, get the group together. Uh, Della. Carlos, um, yes. as I mentioned before, in that timeline number two, Della Linquist, Deputy General Counsel, um, it is part of that second sort of track of rulemaking that would start, at, well, it should be before you at the, mar at the mid to late March meeting. That means we would have need to have started on some rulemaking by probably December. The work groups. Uh, convene to discuss this whole second phase so that we have something to present to you in March. All right. Thank you. All right. David. Yes, David. Uh, uh, David Bruce, I'm sorry. The last uh, part of that conversation maybe kind of confused me somewhat, so forgive me. I could just be hungry. But so <laughs> right now, are we allowed from the TDLNR to send out electronic certificates? No. Or, so the answer is no. No. Okay. Thank you. So, go ahead, Dan. Nina. No, <laughs> she's leaving alone. I don't. We don't have a dog in this hunt. Right at okay. the moment, so okay. Go ahead, Dave. But, go ahead. But she's got a good point. Um, <laughs> so, is there a course provider or a school doing it now? They're not sending out an electronic certificate. They're not doing that. What they are doing is they are transmitting the student name and certificate number to the actual court themselves. It's, it's an automatic transmission. It's not being sent to the student electronically. It's being sent to the court electronically. And then they are actually mailing a, a physical certificate to the student to go turn into the court so there can be a check and balance on that. Okay. And we, we, we've been made aware of that. And we'll be discussing that. Thank you. Are there other comments, questions? If not, uh, that's going to be the end of this portion of the summit. I'm going to turn over the meeting back to the chairman. Um, so we're done with our discussion. Thank you so much, you. Uh, Ray, Kerry. I really appreciate the presentation. Thank you so much for the audience for participating, members.
Um, any questions, by the way, before I continue on the next? We're going to wrap it up real quickly. I apologize that we skipped lunch and a break, so we're out of here in just a few minutes. Uh, any questions, comments, members, before I continue to item L, I guess wrap up by the department staff. Anything else, Brian? No, I, I believe that what Ray and, and Ford and, and Carrie, you guys did a great job. What they talked about, I think, is uh, a significant or sufficient enough wrap up. Uh, the one thing I, I want to um, reiterate to the committee is we want to do more of these summits to have more of a dialogue at these meetings. Again, the, the, the thought process is when we have the wisdom of the folks together, why not take advantage of that? And so getting different questions and issues uh, that may be burning issues that we can talk about uh, help us uh, be smart in the way that we regulate. Uh, so let's start thinking about doing this more and more down the road of having a summit or a conversation uh, as part of the, uh, the advisory board meetings. Hopefully you guys found it instructive to hear the, the, the back and forth, because I know I did. I benefited from it. It was very informative, absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Shen. Thank you so much. Um, item M, recommendations for agenda items for the next committee meeting and future summits. Uh, board members, that's for us. Anything we'd like to talk about? Carlos? <laughs> I, I know there was something, your face. Uh, yeah. we, there was something we were going we were going to discuss, but uh, since it's been a while since so we met, I forgot what it was we were going to discuss. Sure. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we'll, we'll definitely have the uh, staff reports. Uh, we'll have the comments coming back from the, uh, uh, the public comments for the rules that have been proposed. We'll have some follow-up language from the, the discussions that have taken place uh, in, in regard to the summit. And I imagine there'll be a few other things that'll be out there as well. Yeah, I think in the last meeting there was some discussion about bringing up the issue of uh, the testing of students by driver education schools to be discussed uh, in public. And I thought that was supposed to have happened this time. So. I don't know if that's still open for the next one or not. I'll consider a motion to add it to the agenda if you'd like for next time. Well, the gentleman that proposed it didn't hear, so. Okay. Just drop that. This is nine to say. Does TDLNR have any regulatory Maybe oversight not. of the testing of students? Uh, we would bring DPS here at, at, at that conversation. Okay. Yeah, the last time we discussed it, they said, no, you all don't, but they still said we could discuss it. Mm -hmm. I think so I just, brought just that want, people want to get some clarification about it. We can be a forum for that conversation, but I mean, we're not going to be a decision maker in that. Anyone uh, else? Then obviously we'll have updates on the Community Safety Education Act, uh, got it right, uh, as well as moving forward with the, the course for the hard of hearing and deaf. Some updates on that. And this is Della, you'll also be um, recommending the adoption of the rules we just looked at. We'll be, be discussing the comments that had come in. So. Sure. Um, Members, um, I just I noticed on our list of um, people on the committee, some term expires eleven one. Is there a process? What happens with that? The, the um, all committee appointments for advisory boards are made by our chairman. Uh, who then brings that to uh, our commission. Um, you know, for example, we have four new advisory boards, sanitarians, code enforcement officers, uh, behavior analysts, and the massage therapists. Uh, those will be going before our commission on a, uh, at their October meeting. And they may take up other um, appointments and vacancies at that one as well. It's an ongoing process. Anyone else? Excellent. Uh, item and discussion of date, time, location for our next committee meeting. I think that we already have a date. Um, Looks like February 10th. 7th. It was the 7th. Seventh. I think it was a Wednesday, Fe yes. February the 7th. I think we're still okay with that, 10 a.m. Anybody? I think we're still good. We had already agreed on that. Fantastic. So I guess our next meeting will meet here February the 7th, 10 a.m. Uh, anything else before I adjourn? That is it. That's a wrap. Thank you so much. That ends this meeting. Thank you.